welcome everyone. Um, we on this intro slide, we're reminding everyone um, how to get to the workshop agenda with the connection information for all the links for the different sessions. Um, we did password protect it so that nobody can dive bomb the <coughs> workshop. Um, and um, when you're in a session that you are presenting in, we're asking that you please raise your hand because we have so many people who are registered that we need to move you over to a panelist just for that session, okay? Um, and we are gonna handle questions through Slack, um, discussion mm -hmm. questions, so um, there's information on how to get to that um, Slack channel there. Um, so what we'll be doing is the moderator for each session is going to read questions from Slack to the presenters. Um, and so we won't be opening up the audio. It's just too complicated with this many presenters. So anyway, welcome to the first UFS user workshop. Uh, I have to say we're excited to see so many people register for this virtual event. Um, we had hoped to host it in person, um, but at least we are able to connect virtually. And uh, we hope that everyone uh, is managing to stay safe and, and healthy during these trying times. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the um, organizers, the orga organizing committee, um, all the time they put into organizing the agenda, dealing with uh, how to, how to put, a, put together a virtual event. Um, it's a little bit challenging. I think they've come up with um, a pretty good plan. We might have some hiccups along the way, so um, have some patience with us. Um, this isn't what we got our degrees in IT stuff, but um, the group's been working really hard to figure it all out. So I wanted to um, introduce our first speaker. Um, Neil Jacobs has kindly joined us to give some introductory remarks. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to him. Um, Neil, I'll give you a heads up at about 10 minutes um, so you can wrap up. And then if there's any questions, uh, we have time for that. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I am uh, currently on my front porch trying to talk over a bunch of cicadas. Um, now I can see myself on HD. If you have questions, please don't ask me why I haven't taken down my Christmas lights. Um, so you're going to probably hear a whole lot of talks about uh, planned releases, projects, funding, all sorts of things. Um, so rather than than dig into a lot of that what i really wanted to do is just spend a, a couple of minutes talking about two fundamental questions uh why do we want a, a ufs and why should it be a community model uh so why do we want a ufs this this is is i think fairly uh simple to answer this is a conversation i've been talking uh over the years with a lot of people and that's primarily just to simplify the production suite uh, align development efforts both um, from a physical science perspective as well as the software engineering side um, and see where things are headed and everything's really headed in the direction of high resolution and more probabilistic guidance so you know that i see you know things coming together eventually with high res ensembles at some point it, it really it makes it a lot it makes it a, a lot easier to think about this when we're only dealing with with one type of modeling framework um, and then also if if you've seen those plots um, from the old the old production suite of this patchwork quilt of all sorts of different models it's it's not only as expensive to maintain and run but it's also complicated for for maintenance on the different models and the software but more importantly why why should it be a community model well ultimately what what i really wanted to do was try to figure out how do we tap into this massive wealth of of expertise in the community when industries uh universities um, wharf is a really good example uh, so i started out with mm5 and then switched over to wharf everyone i knew in the academic community worked on wharf and our goal was to write papers improve code um, and then if you get a publication out or you get a mention in some of the source code of something you modified that was you know that was what your goal was uh, but it was easy to work with uh, the code was pretty straightforward i can remember several different times going in and, and tinkering and modifying the code i remember at one point 
email and Hugh Morrison about the microphysics scheme. And there was an array in there that was calculated and not written out. And I wanted to write it out because I could derive snow crystal type. Uh, and I was developing an application for the, the ski industry. But then I realized later on, this was also useful for predicting uh, avalanches as well as how you know, commercially aviation and, and uh, airport operators would treat the surface of a runway. So there's a lot of different reasons why you would want access to this, but Wharf made it really easy because it was so user friendly. The GFS on the other hand is not, or it didn't used to be. Uh, I remember back starting messing around with the GFS code, probably 2005, 2006, uh, had, a, had a team of, of quite a few smart people working on this. Um, we gave up on Linux and ended up just getting an IBM P5575 system uh, because so much of the code was hard coded for AIX. Uh, ultimately that evolved in iDataplex and then Linux Blades. The, but the problem and the challenge there was the barrier to entry was astronomically high. You know, unless you had expertise with this particular type of code, which was not documented, and also had access to your own multi-million dollar supercomputer, uh, you probably weren't going to get very far with doing any kind of development work. Uh, the code wasn't really documented at the time. Uh, I remember that we had uh, the, emailed Steve Lord when he was at NCEP and said, hey, can we get a copy of the GFS code? And they thought, we were completely insane. So once we had it running and word got out, we eventually transitioned the code over to run in the cloud. And the exciting thing about this was it allowed us to deploy additional parallel runs on the fly. Uh, so when people realized that we were actually uh, working with this and doing some um, parallel runs with the actual GFS code, people started coming to us with, uh, with ideas. And if we thought that their idea for either making the code more efficient or improving the forecast skill was something interesting, we could spin up extra nodes and test it. And we looked at like, all sorts of different stuff, testing the impact of different observations from GPSRO, um, at one point reconsidering retrievals versus radiance assimilation, of course, you know, we did a lot of assimilation with aircraft data, including TAMDAR. Uh, we also tinkered around with software efficiencies, um, you know, looking at maybe we could speed things up by recompiling the radio transfer model in 32-bit or something like that, or even random ideas like turn off the Vortex relocation scheme. Uh, we did that for Joaquin and improved the track forecast. And one thing that I would always ask people that would come to us is, hey, have you run this idea by INSEP? And this drove Bill crazy because uh, a lot of times it was, yeah, but they're so resource constrained, uh, they really can't test it. You know, there's, they're just, you know, trying, they're really focused on, on the plan that they've laid out. And this is, you know, this may be a really cool idea, but you got to have a bunch of extra compute and it's, you know, it's just going to be more of a distraction. And so I remember vividly the day I was given a seminar at NCEP. Um, at a brown bag lunch seminar. This is back when NCEP was in the old building. And after the seminar, I'd gone to, to Bill Openta's office and I was sitting in there with Steve Lord and, and Peter Childs. And I remember Bill looking at me and he said, how great it would be if more universities had the ability to run experiments using the GFS. And literally two seconds after that sentence, this earthquake hit. And I remember, I've some of you folks are probably in D.C. when that earthquake hit. I remember looking at him and we were just kind of like, what do we do? Um, don't dive under the table or run out of the building. But that really got me thinking, how do we pull this off? You really only need two things to pull this off. Uh, you need user friendly code that's well documented and you need a code that can run on platforms that that people have access to. Um, like, you know most people in the community. Not everyone either has login credentials to one of Noah's machines or has the financial resources to go buy a giant supercomputer. Uh, so additionally, can we answer those two questions, develop that and streamline the production suite while simultaneously sunsetting legacy models? So this is where the 
the UFS strategic implementation plan comes in. Uh, when I came on board at NOAA, I looked through the SIP, I thought, this is great. How do we accelerate it? And I know that, that Ricky's going to be talking a lot about this coming up next, but we've got the UFS medium range weather app out there now. I know there's going to be a lot of discussions on, you know, S2S and short range and everything else. Oh, by the way, on, on my post on the map listserv yesterday, I do, I do want to correct something. I had mentioned uh, the application uh, uh, development team. It's actually... Um, Mariana, Luisa, and, and Aaron were uh, application release team. The the development team was Christiana Stan, Fang Lin Yang, and Lucas Harris. So apologies for that. Um, so we've got the UFS out on GitHub, and there's clearly interest. There's there's a, lots of forks. There's commits. Uh, I don't even know if we're tracking the downloads. Uh, I was I was at least one of the downloads. I've done it a couple of times now. But how do we know? if it is indeed user friendly so that that's a big question because unless we get a bunch of questions back mm -hmm. uh, we don't necessarily know how user friendly the code is so this is uh this is where the umac had originally devised what they referred to as a graduate student test and and i don't know whether that was ricky cliff um jim cecilia fred gary whoever um came up with the original idea for the graduate student test but it's awesome um so I downloaded the, the, the medium range weather app. Uh, I, I did do a post on the map listserv about running it on my MacBook. I, I didn't even try it first on my MacBook Pro, just my MacBook. And I took the graduate student test. I filled out the survey. Um, and, you know, I, I think I passed. I, I got it in in under six hours the first time. I've done it again a couple of times in under an hour. Um, but but the point is, we spend a lot of time talking about how verification is so critical for model skill. But we also need verification on software utility and ease of use. And this is where the graduate student test is, is so critical. So after my original post on MAP, I got uh, dozens of emails from students. Um, and I wish they had hit reply to all instead of just replying to me so that everyone else on the list sort of could see how much interest there was and excitement there was when they actually were able to get it to run on their laptop. Imagine running the GFS on your laptop. Um, you know, I'd also be interested to hear from faculty whether or not, you know, this is something that would be a useful teaching tool. I'm sure it would be because I remember taking classes where we were learning uh, numerical weather prediction using MM5 and WARF. Uh, so community involvement uh, is obviously essential for the UFS to reach its, its full potential. And I know a lot of folks probably look at this as this is a lot of NOAA funded work, um, but I, I really want to sort of at a very high level frame uh, the, where, we're, where we're trying to go here. And that is that the UFS is not uh, by NOAA for the community. And I know that's going to sound really strange uh, when it really seems like a lot of the heavy lifting has been done by NOAA at first, but it, it had to start out that way because the original versions of all the code were hard coded towards NOAA machines. Um, it really needs to be the UFS uh, with the community for NOAA. Uh, and I think a lot of the heavy lifting uh, is is behind us. Uh, we've already proven we can put it out there and it's user friendly and runnable. Uh, it's also becoming more and more better. There's more documentation. It can run on additional platforms. Uh, so that was a couple of years ago when I originally started talking about this idea, uh, had made it very clear that there would be an initial heavy lift on us to sort of get this to a point where the community uh, could run it. But um, now it's time for the community to work with NOAA to drive the innovation. And I view our, our job as not to tell the community what to do, but to provide the tools and foster a collaborative environment uh, for innovation. Because ultimately, and this is some self-serving on my part, ultimately that innovation is what's going to feed back to improve NOAA's mission. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, just really want to uh, thank everyone for joining i see we over 320 attendees so far so this is uh this is exciting it's a new paradigm for noaa and we're learning as we go too so 
um, you know, not just, uh, uh, I would ask that you not just provide feedback on the, you know, the software and the code, but also feedback on the process and the governance, because we're all in this together. And the only way this is gonna be successful is if we as the community are successful. So um, I guess we could take a few questions. I don't have Slack open, so I'll rely on someone to uh, read those. Yeah, so Wei Wei, is there um, some questions for Neil? Hi, Louise, um, I don't know if Wei Wei is able to unmute or not, but there is a comment from Brian Gross. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not aware that I'm muted. So, yeah, oh. this one from Brian Gross. Um, he said, thank you, Neil, clarifying that the UFS is by the community for NOAA is very helpful. Indeed, I see the UFS is an organization agnostic community-based system that is contributed to and used by NOAA and other agencies, academy organizations, and the private sector, et cetera. Any refinement you can offer to this view? Um, not, not really. That was, that was really well said. I, I think that, the, you know, uh, probably the most important thing is that, uh, we make sure that uh, we have an open, transparent process as this involves. Um, you know, I, I don't want NOAA to be viewed as kind of a black box development community and then surprise, we, we made this for everyone, here you go. Uh, we really need to have a collaborative, transparent process along the way. And I, I think that's in some of, in some of the the read ahead material there was there was mention of uh, building trust and collaboration. I think that a lot of that will come naturally uh, if we run a transparent and collaborative process uh, with the entire community because everyone's everyone's got to have ownership in this. Ultimately, this is going to be the community's model. Uh, and crowdsourcing model development, I think it is the way forward. But it's really, we're relying on the community. In other words, what I said earlier, we can't tell the community what to do. Uh, we need to create uh, an environment which incentivizes the collaboration. And to the extent that we can, uh, that's what we need to do, at least from NOAA's end. And the second question is from Mike Eck. Is, um, the hierarchical system development approach was called out specifically in the NOAA APIC, R, uh, RP, APIC RFP. So do you have thoughts about this? Um, I do, uh, but we are, uh, the EPIC RFP is still out on the street uh, and we're in the blackout phase and just due to a lot of the, um, uh, the procurement and contracting restrictions. I can't really talk too much about how this uh, plays into that. Um, but again, so this for, for everyone's awareness, that these are just contracting rules and we're trying to run um, a really clean process on this. So this, this, uh, this isn't us keeping secrets. This is just standard contracting RFP protocol within the government. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we'll be we'll be talking more about that soon. And, and once once that period closes, I expect that we'll be doing a lot of additional webinars uh, where we're going to be soliciting a lot of feedback from the community on this. Hi, Louise. I think these are all the questions that I can get from Slack. OK. Well, thank you so much, Neil. Um, I don't know whether you'll be able to hang around for the rest of the session. We do have a Q&A at the end. Um, I, I know you're a busy person, so. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna be logged in. This, you know, this is probably one of my top priorities. So um, I'll be logged in and muted and listening. So if there's questions, I may be able to type some answers in, in the chat box here. Okay, thank you so much.
All right, well, we'll move on to our next speakers. Um, this is a tag team presentation. Um, uh, UFS System Overview by Ricky Rude from University of Michigan and Hendrick Tolman from uh, NWS o OSTI. These are our um, UFS Steering Committee co-chairs. And so I will turn it over to Ricky to start off. I'll give you a warning at six minutes, Ricky. Um, looks like Ricky's not unmuted yet. Ricky, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, it, it works now. Thank you. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, we can. And I assume you can see my screen as well. Okay, yes. thank, thank you, Neil. Um, during that earthquake, I was actually giving a talk in Silver Spring and all of us being trained as good weather people, we ran to the window to look out, which I think is at the bottom of the list of what you're supposed to do. So I'm gonna give a very simple talk today to introduce um, the strategic plan that is currently out for review. And I'll give a, a link that provides everybody access to this review copy. Uh, the first thing I want to do is is to um, thank the, the steering committee. I'm not the steering committee, the organizing committee um, for doing an enormous amount of logistical work and getting this together. It's very complicated um, instructions because of all the sessions and things like that. So I encourage everybody to, to, to be careful. And I think Hendrick, um, since you're having trouble finding the agenda, the, the password is actually written right on that page with the password. Um, so the workshop is expected to improve communications, transparency, and mutual trust between the operational centers and the broader community. So that is one of the, the goals um, that the organizing committee put out. So what I wanna do is talk about this strategic plan 2021 to 2025 that is currently in a very um, advanced draft form. I like to think it's close to, to completed. Um, the team that wrote it is listed here over on, on the left of, of the view graph. And we used material from the previous SIP, three pagers, the R2O project. And uh, we, we actually made the effort not to ask people to be rewriting things from before. So we pulled it together from existing materials, which are really quite extensive. And what is presented in this particular document is just really four sections, uh, an introduction, a presentation of UFS forecast skill priority, science and system goals, which some people I think will find to be the most important things there. And then UFS organizational and management priorities, which I think some other people might find to be very important. And then a, what I'll call a notional schedule that um, really comes out of EMC and and um, VJ was one of the leads on doing that, and Brian presented it at the um, AMS meeting. So all I'm going to do here is for each chapter um, point out some important points. Um, the the first um, in the introduction, I want to just say this is building off the two pre previous SIP plans, the strategic implementation plans. One of the most important things that um, we, we've done within this effort in the last two to three years is a continuity of plans um, to not only write plans, but to follow them and then revise them. But compared to the SIP plan, what you will see is that the document I'm talking about today separates out aspects of strategies from those of implementation. And if you Read, read it, you will see um, that essentially the SIP is divided into um, three or four documents, depending on how you count, and they're in various levels of development. Uh, one of the things that's also important in the introduction 
is the government governance is being realigned to um, to to use the applications and the products as the integrating theme to pull all the things together. The the next chapter is, I think I can say safely, the most complete um, integrated presentation of forecast skill priorities um, that we've had within um, this sort of activity um, in, in history and the describes the forecast skills skill priorities i'm sorry i wrote scores there it's supposed to be priorities um, for each application um, and then it describes six major science goals and one of the things i want to point out here is that there's been a lot of discussion that if you focus too much on forecast skill you can achieve that um, without doing science especially well. So that paragraph there is basically saying that we, we're committed to improve accuracy through strengthening you know, the scientific foundation and that these two things work together. And then with, there are some systems goals um, that the UFS has, you know, that are to improve community engagement, simplify the short range weather and convection, allowing them. You know, um, model suite, improve workflow, and evolve the hierarchical systems development capability. The next chapter or the next section has UFS organizational and management priorities. And the important points from this one is to describe the priorities of the steering committee. And then it describes the organizing principles of the UFS and in the quotation there is that the UFS is a unified system because its applications share a set of agreed upon scientific components and a set of agreed upon infrastructures. The scientific components and infrastructures are integrated into a consistent system architecture. So this chapter, especially for those coming in new, since we are up to 334 people in this meeting so far, and I think there are actually over 500 registered, um, defines the applications, introduces the system architecture, and lists those foundational decisions that are at the core of what makes the UFS unified. So we've been talking sometimes about the, the difficulty of keeping the unification, um, keeping, keeping that alive. And then also important in this is it describes the strategic relationships of the UFS, which lists the organizations already contributing to the, USF, to the UFS through infrastructures and components. And very importantly, this brings expertise and software that would not uh, be available without the community. And just as an example of this, I took a screenshot of the infrastructure community because if we go back here the infrastructure is one of the foundational decisions and you can see that between those five major infrastructure um, components there that um, we we span many many uf agent agencies and i think it's incredibly important to um, to recognize that really anything we do at this point already has um, community contributions that have um, come through um, the infrastructure. And then as well, if you look at the contents over here, you'll see that there are the components and then, then ultimately we are anticipating Epic and the others. And this actually has the agreed upon components over there. Two minutes, Ricky. Okay. And so finally, um, the schedule. Um, VJ uh, took the lead on putting together a schedule that's been known as the rainbow diagram, which shows a pretty ambitious uh, transition um, from the current operational suite to the eight UFS, or I guess now seven UFS applications. And we also present a set of releases from NCEP and the UFS in the next year. And I think one of the 
again, the important steps here is the short range, the short range weather release uh, will be a research model for the community. It will be have a limited um, area model with the FV3 die core in it. And this release is, is really a, 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 a research version that's out before um, a simultaneous um, operational release. So where is this available? The plan is open for comment to the community. There's a link here in this presentation it's also on the portal if you go to about governance and then to the minutes. So here's a screenshot of the portal. If you go to about governance over here in the minutes, then you will get to the strategic plan. And that's all I have to say. Hi, Mickey. There's there we go. So, yeah, there's one one question from Slack. So, Louisa, do you want me to go ahead? We're, we're going to wait until the joint presentation's over. Okay. Questions. So, if you can um, set Hendrick up to present. Okay. There you go. Okay, there we go. Did you get my screen yet, or do I have to try this again? No, we, we see your screen. Okay, cool. Then I'll show you something better. Okay, part two. Uh, Ricky talked about the plan. I'm talking about the fact that we actually make progress. One of the big issues with uh, these kind of efforts like a UFS is that it's all talk and all plans and no, pro no progress. Uh, and what you get with that is uh, is uh, disbelief that we're actually making progress. So I'm just going to uh, point out a few things that actually were all, also already pointed out by Neil uh, without a lot of slides around that to keep it short. So first of all, it is a team effort. Uh, this is a slide that um, uh, Cecilia made for the Boston AMS meeting, just showing the enormous amount of folks already working on this, whether it's components, whether it's uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, we have federal co federal uh, collaborators, we have universities, we have industry partners. And uh, that resulted at AMS meeting in already 50 papers or so to be identified by UFS centric. So this is not just NOAA, it's a much bigger team. Secondly, the graduate student test, uh, this is a term that we actually used for Wave Watch and for um, uh, H4F uh, already way back before this became popular. So Neil, that's where it's coming from, I believe. And I'm pretty sure we stole it from somebody too. Uh, I can keep this really short. Uh, Neil didn't have to buy a supercomputer. He could do it on his Mac in six hours. And so that makes Neil a, a really good graduate student. And we've done this with quite a few folks. And this is really helpful to uh, to be able to do this because you can actually prove and document that it's, an, that it's a, a, a useful model. It's not just what we say. The fact that we actually have a real a release tra strategy and that we're actually not just putting stuff out there is really important. Uh, we have the medium range weather application out there now. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, 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 some plans about the standalone regional. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on the hurricane model, and there are at least six or so uh, uh, not released yet, but uh, available uh, prototypes for coupled models. And um, I want to make sure that we realize that it's not just weather, but this is uh, all the other applications out there too. And the neat thing is that we really have to focus on the weather side because the weather side was the one that was not really uh, that well uh, open and available to the public. Uh, things like MOM6 ocean model, the wave watch uh, uh, wave model, the h work model, the um, uh, CICE model, all these are already community models that are already pretty uh, open and easily available and are already uh, individually close to graduate student tests. So the, the progress needed to be made on the weather side, but it doesn't mean we are only working weather. The other thing which is really important is the fact that we actually have a support strategy that we can run this on the different uh, computers as uh, uh, was already uh, pointed out by Neil. It's documented and uh, there are forums and there's uh, training going on and of course really important. Things like this workshop that we're doing right now is uh, a really good way to uh, actually build a community. 
it's one thing to have things accessible it's one thing to have the links there it's one thing to make it easy but uh, seeing it happen and doing hands-on things that is uh, is much more uh, uh, important for building a community if you look at what happened with uh, h 4 and wave watch uh, the real community was built by actually having training workshops that we're doing and so these workshops are good but the fact that we are planning to do a uh, real uh, hands-on training with the code uh, will grow this community a lot further still then there are prototypes it's not just weather these six prototypes have been shown over the last year or so they include things that are completely non-weather like the EdCirc uh, wave watch coupling for the coastal act but also are the prototypes for the seasonal and sub-seasonal ones and um, i could talk about this for hours too but the whole point is it's not just the weather side these prototypes may not be fully uh, uh supported yet and it may take a while before we get there uh, but these are in the different repositories and code bases and the whole point is that uh, particularly the the fe3 mom6 cis5 coupling uh, with or without wave watch is our prototype for our sub seasonal uh, and uh, uh, seasonal systems and is already massively outperforming uh, particularly the ice in uh, uh, the present cfs next one uh, uh, ricky talked about this this is uh, what we call the rainbow diagram, uh, the fact that we actually have a plan to simplify the production suite. On the left are uh, just the major codes that are right in production right now. If we're going to the right, you see the, the, the color bars becoming broader and broader on the right side of the graph are much fewer applications that are in operations and uh, we could go to less than 10 from 26. So the fact that we actually have a plan for this and that we're actually making connections already uh, particularly on the global side and that there is going to be a massive uh, uh, simplification of particularly the regional side uh, is uh, is proof of the fact that this is not just uh, just us talking this is actually us going forward rapidly but then one of the biggest parts of this is all about culture and culture comes from inside and comes from outside so i want to take this opportunity in the introductory talk to recognize that uh, the culture change has to come from within NOAA and from outside of NOAA. And that uh, for that reason, there is something called the Silver Sherman Award that um, uh, was uh, instituted by the NOAA administrator a few years back, uh, allowing us as uh, senior leadership in, uh, in uh, NOAA to recognize people for the work they're doing. Stan and I decided to take our individual awards and instead of having individual awards, uh, making a, a mini team award for to recognize cross-line office uh, collaboration and particularly because the cross-line office uh, work between OAR and weather service is uh, showcasing a culture change that is needed for the UFS as it's starting within the weather service and we'll let uh, uh, Stan say two or three things about that but uh, without further ado since we cannot do this in person uh, Stan and I have decided that uh, we want to give our uh, Silver Sherman Awards this year to Jacob Carley and Curtis, Curtis Alexander. And if you can read the text on the uh, on the digital, not yet signed version of it, it's for leadership and exceptional cross-line office collaboration in development, improvement, and operational implementation of NOAA's convection allowing weather models and now casting capabilities. Uh, so uh, congratulations, Jacob and Curtis. You will get the official regalia uh soon and uh, if uh, this is effectively my last slide but i really want uh stan to have the opportunity to uh, have, use half of my tools and to say something about this too if uh, we can give uh, stan the microphone uh, thank you and if you want to go back to the slide there with uh, jacob's names and curtis's names on that together just to uh point out the continuity between the last decade and this decade and the actual accomplishments done by Jacob and Curtis in leading the convective allowing modeling capabilities that actually have gotten in at NSEP already. And now with the plans that they're gonna tell us more about with the UFS era as we go into this decade. So uh, Kendrick and I are just delighted to uh, work together on getting this recognition about this cross line office. This is kind of unprecedented, but hopefully there'll be more of these uh, coming up in the future. But uh, Jacob and Curtis have set the tone for what this ought to look like with NOAA research and uh, new other service working together. So big congratulations to both Curtis and Jacob. Yeah, and, and we want to recognize, of course, that through, the, through recognizing their leadership, we recognize the entire team, which is much bigger, but we, we only have, have one award each that can give out, so therefore we recognize the leadership here.
Uh, I don't know if, um, if uh, we have uh, uh, 30 seconds and if Jacob and, uh, and Curtis are available to give a response. Otherwise, we will put them on the spot at another time. Uh, I'll leave that to, uh, to our, uh, our uh, leadership uh, running the show right now because I think we're already running late. Uh, uh, Lisa? So Alec, I want to extend my congratulations to you. You guys have worked very hard. I think uh, Jacob can easily unmute um, if he wanted to say something because he is a speaker in this session. Yes. Um, Hello. Hi, this is Jacob. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, just I'm I'm humbled and uh, just really appreciative of these awards. Uh, I'll just say it's it's been an absolute pleasure um, just doing this work, uh, collaborating, uh, working with Curtis especially, um, and all of our colleagues in OAR. Um, we're really looking forward to just keeping that going and realizing the success of the UFS. Um, just tremendously thankful. Thank you. Curtis, I think I managed to allow you to unmute yourself. I'm a little uh, yeah. can, you, can you hear me, Louisa? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah, I'll just echo the same thing that Jacob just said. I want to thank um, everyone for the recognition. Obviously, certainly humbled, as, as Jacob mentioned, and it's obviously been a blast working with Jacob on all aspects of uh, regional uh, modeling efforts uh, with the CAM. Uh, and so, you know, I certainly look forward to continuing that collaboration going forward. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, promise, uh, the progress already been made, but the, the promise and the potential for uh, where we're going with, uh, like I said, unification of the, the efforts on that front. So uh, thank uh, you and everybody else uh, that have been uh, helping with uh, this recognition, Hendrick and, and Stan and others. So, uh, and it is a team effort. There's so many people that are involved in this collaboration. So I don't want to lose sight of that as well, but thank you. Yay. Um, I think so we did start a little bit late um, so I think we could entertain one one question for this presentation Wei Wei. Yes uh, there is one uh, that's have one question coming from Slack is from Dave Turner the question is the UFS is more than just a model the modeling system includes a data simulation module and a verification system Making the data available to drive and evaluate the model is important if the community is going to emulate and improve it upon what is run operationally. Is there a plan to make these data available and in the right format? I realize there are some data sets that are protected and cannot be shared. Um, so, so this is Ricky. Um, so to your to your first point, if you look at the architecture and things, you'll see that the data assimilation and the post processing um, are part of a UFS application. And so we view that what we're building are applications, uh, ultimately not models. So they're in there. Um, it is not currently within our discussions, the issues on that end use um, data availability. Um, I don't know if Hendrick has more to say. That's been a little bit out of our bailiwick at this point. Yeah, so, so uh, from the NOAA perspective, uh, one of our five uh, major strategic drives that, uh, and probably Neil could say something about that too, is, uh, is uh, the cloud and, and data in general. So, so we are, as NOAA, are, are looking at moving all our data into the cloud. Uh, and one of the real important things for being able to uh, support the UFS with that is to have all these data available to, uh, to uh, either use an initialization that is available from the cloud or do your own data simulation. And um, yeah, yeah, we recognize that there are some data that cannot be shared, but the large majority of the data that we have available is shareable. Uh, and there are all kinds of other issues that we need to deal with. but the long and the short of it is that there is a NOAA cloud strategy and a NOAA data strategy that is being uh, executed, and we are uh, we are working on uh, finishing up the uh, uh, the implementation plan of uh, that specific one. And I don't know if Neil wants to say anything else about that. If he's still around, <laughs> I think we're going to move on. 
um, because we are running a little bit behind. So now we're going to move into talks by um, the leads for the application teams. And I believe if I caught the chat correctly that um, Lucas Harris is actually going to give the presentation for the medium range weather and seasonal to sub-seasonal application team. So, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Just a second. I need to restart my app to be able to present. Just a second. Hey, this is Neil. While uh, while Lucas is starting, I just posted something in the chat, but wanted to um, uh, second what Hendrix said. Having observations and data in the cloud is, is just as essential as being able to run the models there. So it's really going to streamline the, the effort so we can avoid moving uh, files and observation and initial conditions uh, all over the place from the cloud to on-prem and back and forth. Thank you for chiming in, Neil. Did, did we lose Lucas? Yeah, I believe so. I think Lucas is trying to restart his computer and try to re-log in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was there any other questions on the Slack while we're waiting for Lucas to get back on? Right, there's some comments from um, from Rich Signal. He just said um, making the UFS data available in the cloud optimized format would be amazing. Okay. Yeah. And also, there's some people. Congratulations to Curtis and Jacob. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sounds very good. Do we? If Lucas got off and gets back on, do we have to change him back over to panelist crew? We do. Uh, we do, yes. Okay. And also, uh, I just want to say to all of the presenters, if you can have some time to take a look at the Slack channel, that will be very, very helpful because some people leave some comments after your presentation. Uh, it's not necessary uh, questions, but they're all good comments. I saw Neil Jacob um, post a comments to organizer and the panelists, but I think these are for the broad attendees. He said, storing data and observations in the cloud is just as essential as being able to run the models there. Hello? Is that you, Lucas? That's me, yeah. Okay. Are you able to take over Catherine sent you an invite to present. Uh, yes, I can, yes. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll give you a warning at 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep, we can. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm going to report on the, uh, uh, on the uh, activities of the medium range weather and uh, subseasonal seasonal application team or a team. Uh, I have the co-chairs of this application team are Fang Lin Yang who represents the operational community, Christiana Stan who represents the academic community and myself representing the research community. So uh, the medium range weather and S2S application team uh, represent uh, applications on leads of five to five days out to a single year, which covers an awful lot of stuff. This covers mostly our, re our global models, the GFS and the GEFS, which covers a lot of different topics. So we've uh, come up with a list of uh, operational and forecast priorities as well as science goals. And a major activity of this application team is to be able to link these two together either during this uh, as the activities of our group. So we have our uh, forecast and operational priorities given as critical issues, short-term priorities, long-term priorities, and a list of scientific goals. And so here's a list of uh, scientific goals. I'm not going to go through each one of these is over and over again, uh, but what I do want to mention is that this is one of the main challenges of uh, global modeling is that you have a lot of different things and to get good skill, you need to get everything right everywhere at once in the same model configuration. But that is also a great opportunity in that it gives us many uh, many sources of skill, many many sources of predictability that we can that we can leverage, as well as this is the opportunity to create a lot of really neat new applications with this model and create new 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 tools and new products through the capabilities given to us by the UFS. 
So uh, there's a set of pro forecast priorities, and here are the critical issues that have been uh, uh, that we want to most quickly correct. And indeed, uh, one th uh, there's going to be discussion of the next two oper operational implementations of the GFS and the GEFS. Uh, that'll be discussed tomorrow by Fanglan and DJ. And uh, they really made a lot of uh, a lot of great progress towards addressing and improving upon these goal these goals. Uh, the big ones are improving the PBL structure and inversions. This is important for surface temperature, uh, temperature profile, and stratocumulus, which is a big thing for a lot of global models. Uh, also improving continental United States temperature and precipitation, particularly extreme temperature forecasts. We want to extend skillful hurricane track prediction beyond the current five days that hurricanes are predicted out towards. And uh, one of the biggest things about, biggest improvements in the GFS, for the GFS ensemble is that there has been a significant improvement in the spread of the ensemble forecast. And then we also have a set of uh, short-term and a set of long-term priorities we want to address as well. Um, so, uh, so this covers again the entire entire atmosphere here from the tropics, where you want to improve the MJO and tropical waves, uh, to the mid latitudes, where you want to improve uh, AC, 500 millibar ACC and the problem of two fast tropical cyclones, and to improve high latitude variability. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the challenge of global modeling. You have to get everything right everywhere, but it is again the opportunity of global modeling as well. And then also we have our long-term priorities. We want to improve the uh, S2S uh, alphabet soup of uh, climate modes. And also we want to take, take advantage of the new functionality from the UFS to start to produce a lot of, a lot of new uh, forecast products. We can look forward to producing new uh, hydro, hydro, hydrological forecasts produced directly within the uh, global models, as well as uh, ocean waves forecasts, something that should be coming up soon in the G GFS Ensemble version 12. And something I'm really excited about is there's some indication that we can get skillful uh, S2S predictions of severe weather outbreaks and of intense hurricanes. So there's some exciting things that are coming down the pipeline that we're, uh, that we're hoping to be able to realize within the next, uh, uh, within the next couple upgrades. So uh, certainly we have, uh, see, have, have uh, we have a main focus on the upcoming up operational implementations, but we want to discuss the next next implementations as well. That's the GEFS version 13, GFS version 17. Uh, these are going to be uh, not just an integrated system between the GFS and the GEFS, but we also plan, but there's also a plan to be a, a coupled system. We're going to couple the UFS ATM to the MOM6 Ocean Model, CIS5, and WaveWatch 3. Uh, and furthermore, we want to go into the, we want to start to use the uh, JEDI uh, data simulation framework to start doing weak coupling of these different components of the Earth's Earth system. I'm going to go forward towards improving the physics, especially for uh, version 17. We want to go to higher ver higher horizontal resolution and be able to go to advanced physics, so better integrated microphysics and aerosols, uh, improving the PBL and surface layer. Uh, there's a very large community that we're joining on uh, EDMF uh, schemes that's being introduced for GFS version uh, 16. Improving, of course, SGS convection biography, producing extensive reanalysis and reforecasts. Uh, this would be useful not just for forecast, give uh, forecasters an idea of the biases and give confidence for the system, but also uh, as an example, what we can do with the cloud to be able to do these sorts of reforecasts and reanalyses, and also to update the land service model to uh, something like NOAA MP or GFDL LM4. And uh, so Jessica Mike's in her presentation on Wednesday. She's going to present a lot about the uh, new uh, Earth system capabilities within and the UFS, as well as many, many uh, uh, presentations on coupled uh, data simulation. So I want to discuss a little bit about some of the research results that we've been, that we, you can find with the, uh, with the, that are forthcoming, with the, or that we've been able to find with uh, the new capabilities ordered to us by the UFS. And uh, so here's an interesting collaboration we've had with the uh, European Center. They give us initial conditions. We run it in our experimental model. We give them back forecasts. Uh, this is a paper that's published by my colleague uh, Jan Wei Chen last year, in which we found that not only do we can use our experimental model to improve upon the track forecasts in the then operational GEF, GFS, as the legacy uh, spectral GFS, we found that when we use the initial conditions from the European Center, we can actually improve upon the European Center's forecasts. And this result that fluctuates a bit from year to year, from basin to basin. But the overarching goal is that one is that we have a very good foundation available to us. We have a very good forward model available to us in the UFS that we can take advantage of to be able to improve our forecast skill by giving us da better data assimilation. And, and that's what are going to be our real goal to be able to improve our forecasts. And here's one example of this. The uh, new GF, the GFS version 15 has a, a six category GFDL microphysics in it. And one application is this by my colleague uh, Ming Jing Tong, which she worked with uh, her colleagues at EMC and NESDIS. And here, what they're able to do is they're able to extend the all sky data assimilation, radiance assimilation, to go towards all to assimilating in uh, precipitating areas as well as just cloudy areas. Let's allow you to assimilate more data in the very, uh, very intense convection in the tropics and in the extra tropics and tropical cyclones. 
tons, it gives you more information about the most critical areas in the atmosphere for forecasts. And what they found is that they found that they got a statistically significant improvement when you uh, assimilate the, the, the precipitating areas as well, uh, about a whole point, up to almost a point at day five. And furthermore, there's some promise about being able to also assimilate to also cycle hydrometeors as well, something we can do now that we have the full six category microphysics. Now I should point out the always caveat that there's always a long way from a research result to an operational implementation and uh, you can just cram it in but that's not necessarily going to give you better forecast. It takes a lot of work to be able to develop the entire holistic system when you do have an improvement. And furthermore, there needs to be a lot of testing, a lot of vetting to make sure that these results are not just useful for an operational system but they are also useful to the forecasts, to the forecasters, excuse me. Uh, now, one other thing we can do with the capabilities in the UFS when you start talking about fully seamless modeling from climate scale to convective scale. And I'm going to give an example using the uh, Manajulian oscillation as a unifying theme. So here's a CMIP class uh, UFS model. This is uh, the GFDL CMIP 6 models, which use the AM4 atmosphere, coupled to MOM6 and the LM4 land model. This is relatively coarse atmospheres of 100 kilometers. Uh, but one thing that I found, even at these relatively coarse resolutions, that as long as you couple to the to an ocean, that you do get it, a useful propagating MJO that has a decent amplitude, a little bit on the weak side. But this is something that's capable already at 100 kilometers. You can do this to do a whole lot of climate climate uh, studies with, that they interact with all sorts of different components in the Earth system. But you can go beyond that. You can go to higher resolution, either with our 50 kilometer atmosphere in our sphere, our coupled uh, seasonal to decadal model or our 25 kilometer shield, which is a uh, GFS-like model with a mixed layer ocean. It's that mixed layer ocean that allows us to get better skill in this GFS-like model. So as long as you have any sort of uh, ocean represented, you can get good propagation, even at relatively coarse resolution. But now once you have the good mean state propagation, you can start talking about good predictions. And with this 25 kilometer model, again, with mixed layer ocean, we find that we get useful predictability of the MJOs index out to 28 days. But we can go beyond that. We can take advantage of the variable resolution capabilities from the, G, from the uh, FB3 dynamical core that's available within the UFS. And uh, we can do this thing that uh, Tim Palmer suggested to me. He said that if, uh, if MGL has a lot of problems at the maritime continent, why, why not put a convective scale nest over the maritime continent? So here's a four kilometer nest there. And we test with the most difficult cases during uh, Dynamo, in which you have MJOs that are about to propagate through the maritime continent. And we found that when we put in that four kilometer nest, we're able to usefully extend the propagation of the MJO so we get we get useful skill out to even as far as 40 days. And this is again in the same sort in the same UFS modeling system. We can zoom in the maritime continent, we can take advantage of getting better results there, but allowing the MJO to propagate through the maritime continent usefully. We can go beyond that, and as we'll hear later, uh, in particular from uh, Jacob Carley and many others, we have a number of different nested W periodic regional domains that are available to us for a variety of purposes of everything from operational and experimental forecasting out to uh, process studies. So here's an example, RCE MIP, uh, Radio of Convective Equilibrium. Uh, we subject, submitted a couple of uh, mo uh, Radio of Convective Equilibrium models to this uh, global intercomparison of many different models. Well, we can go even farther beyond that, we start talking about global cloud resolving modeling. And uh, here's something that uh, GFDL and NASA, we've been collaborating together for over a decade on uh, FP3 based uh, uh, global cloud resolving modeling. Uh, we both submitted uh, uh, GCRMs to this uh, Diamond project, a, a global cloud resolving modeling uh, international air comparison. So this is a very exciting new data set, but it's kind of a it's kind of a solution looking for a problem. And one it, one problem that we've been used to address this with, we partnered with uh, Vulcan Incorporated, and they're taking our global cloud resolving model output, and they want to use machine learning to produce a new moist physics parameterization that can use that lower resolution to emulate the results of the high resolution models. Uh, now we can go beyond that. Now. Now, while we have we have the most efficient non-hydrostatic model in Diamond, uh, so and we've been working on this in Orion, we can get 26 minutes, we can get a day in 26 minutes with 37,000 cores. There's evidence that this this model will scale out well beyond 100, even 100,000 cores. But uh, we want to be able to start taking advantage of the GPU accelerators becoming available. And uh, about a decade ago, uh, NASA Goddard did port uh, FE3 to CUDA, which allowed for from some excellent speed ups on uh, GPU accelerated systems, but Whenever you made a change to the model or you had a new architecture, you needed to rewrite the whole model. So we have this public-private academic partnership to port the UFS ATM into the grid tools domain-specific languages. And this allows us to relatively seamlessly port to 
to a variety of different computing systems. So this can include a number of different GPU systems or to forthcoming systems like ARMs, FPGAs, and maybe and maybe whatever whiz bang things coming down the line. Uh, my uh, my uh, excellent colleagues at uh, at Vulcan, uh, Mark Cheeseman and Ria George, they will be presenting uh, these results uh, on Wednesday. And finally, I want to mention the medium range weather application, which Hendrik uh, already uh, already mentioned. Uh, this is a ex this is a major achievement for the UFS community. There's this release earlier in March this year, but we do have even more improvements coming down the pipeline. We had an update to the FD3 dynamic core that was released uh, earlier this year with the technical note that describes it. And we have new updates uh, from FE3 and the inline GFDL microphysics in testing at EMC, as well as a new update to FMS. And uh, Tom Robinson will give you some more uh, details about that in his talk on Wednesday. And uh, with that, I have some acknowledgments. Uh, that is all I have. So thank you very much. And I will take questions now. Thank you, Lucas. So Weiwei, do you want to pass along questions? Yeah. Um... I just have a question, but I'm not sure it's for Lucas or for the broad UFS community, but I'll just read through it. So it's from Ben Cash. Discussions about culture and culture change generally seem to focus almost exclusively on NOAA. Are there any thoughts on the culture of the research academic community vis-a-vis -vis NOAA and how that might need to change? Okay, would uh, you like me to answer that? If can, you like. So I can I can give my uh, perspective on that. So, so my my opinion actually is that the that NOAA actually does make an awful lot of collaborations with uh, external agencies. And for example, I gave the example of the Vulcan collaboration uh, and with uh, UW and another number of different universities a few minutes ago, um, and also the EDMF, which was actually the current EDMF scheme uh, was a collaboration between uh, EMC and uh, Chris Brotherton at the University of Washington. And of course, there's actually been a lot of other uh, success stories of uh, very good uh, people coming in to work with NOAA. I know that uh, University of Rhode Island played a key role in, for many years, in making the GFDL hurricane model a useful operational model, and they did the same for uh, the uh, for uh, the HWARP as well. Um, I'm sure there's many others. I only, yeah, that anybody here can name as well. Um, so, I mean, perhaps there's some issues in which it's not always that communication can be well established and maintained, but I feel that it's there. It just needs to be further developed more than anything. Okay. I think there was one more question from Vijay Weiwei. Yeah, Vijay said, are SHIELD and the SPARE going to be part of UFS? Uh, they already are UFS models. These are uh, these are FE3 and MOM6 based models. Uh, the only thing that's missing is the uh, NEMS cap that I believe uh, WIT tells me it's something that they are working on. Okay. Um, thank you, Lucas. I guess uh, since we are running a little behind, we will move on to the next speaker. And the next speaker is um, Jacob Carley, and he's going to be talking to us about the short range weather application. Looks like Jacob is getting ready to go there. Well, I tried to set up my camera there, but it looks like it's uh, going to require some changes to permissions. So in the interest of time, I'll just keep going. Okay, uh, so what I want to present here is uh, just kind of an overview of where we're at with the short range uh, weather application and just provide a, uh, an overall update. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Curtis Alexander, Jamie Wolf, Lou Wicker, and Jeff Beck, uh, wonderful collaborators, uh, awesome to work with. And this is an effort that uh, really involves a, a, a large team of people spanning a lot of uh, different organizations, NSSL, NCAR, DTC, GSL, uh, EMC. We've got partners in academia as well that are really helping us out and construct this. So um, it's been a wonderful collaborative uh, effort so far. Let's see if I can advance my slides here. There we go, a little bit of lag. All right, uh, so I stole this graphic from the UFS webpage, and what it shows here are the various components associated with the, you know, a typical Earth system model or, or a particular Earth system model. Uh, so we have atmosphere, land, ocean, sea ice, aerosol, ionosphere, storm surge, wave components. And then on the left-hand side here, uh, we have a variety of applications listed. So air quality, coastal space, weather. Here we're focusing on the short range weather application, which includes the atmosphere and land components and really encompasses that short range and convection allowing atmospheric behavior 
uh, from less than an hour uh, out to several days. And so uh, just to kind of get the overall picture uh, out there and up front, uh, the short range weather app uh, includes the finite volume cube sphere dynamical core. We'll be providing a limited area model capability. So just kind of a little snapshot of what that uh, looks like for a particular configuration there on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll be concluded with that uh, as the common community physics package. We'll be providing two suites and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We're providing also an end-to-end -end workflow. So this is something that will uh, cover build, compile, pre-processing, model execution, and post-processing, and then handle all those dependencies uh, associated with the uh, relationship between those different tasks. So you can uh, run this in an automated fashion. We'll also be providing complete documentation so you can get set up and running uh, with confidence as well as a user support forum, which will be staffed by uh, some of the experts that put this uh, system together, and then as well provide a mechanism for the uh, community to participate and try to build uh, knowledge and expertise within the community as well. We're planning to have this out to the public uh, November 2nd, 2020. So we'll start with uh, describing the limited area model capability. So when FP3 uh, was originally uh, selected as a part of the NGGPS project, um, it included some uh, grid refinement capability uh, using a Schmidt transformation as well as a nesting capability, which are uh, uh, great capabilities to have. Um, you can do a lot of great work with that. Uh, but it did not, at the time, have a limited area modeling capability. So that's something that we really wanted to build in. There's a lot of good uh, operational reasons for this. Um, and, and there are other good re reasons for this in terms of uh, just, uh, you know, computational expense savings where you don't have to integrate an entire uh, global domain to run over a, uh, uh, maybe a, perhaps a small area for a short length of forecast time. So uh, we put in uh, uh, some development effort here to develop a limited area model capability. Um, we're calling it the LAM now. Uh, some of you may be familiar with seeing this called the standalone regional or SAR. Uh, we're trying to change the name to something that's a little bit more consistent with what's out there uh, in the literature. So um, you may see SAR uh, throughout a handful of presentations here uh, this week. That's okay. Um, just know that the limited area model and standalone regional are referring to the same thing. Uh, so what we have here are some verification graphics uh, for precipitation forecasts as well as for uh, some high performance computing comparisons between a limited area configuration run over a CONUS domain, it looks just like this, as well as a nested domain uh, within a global model that also covers this exact same uh, area as well. Both run at three kilometers. Uh, so it covers about a month of cases and what we have here are precipitation uh, scores on a performance diagram shaded as critical success index and we have dashed lines here for frequency bias, probability of detection on Y and success ratio there on the X axis. Uh, the red here shows a limited area model, some slight degradation and a couple scores uh, out to forecast hour 60 for these 24 hour accumulation intervals. But overall, uh, the, the, the scores here are, are quite similar across a, a variety of accumulation thresholds. So what we're showing here is that the limited area model is performing about as what we would expect. Um, it's not unexpected to see a little bit degradation when you're running in a limited area model context relative to global with the nest where you're getting boundary updates uh, at the same frequency as the model time step itself. So with the limited area configuration, you'll get that somewhat less frequently. Uh, we also looked at uh, the computational savings we would get. So these are for 24 hour forecasts. On the left hand side here, you have the total CPU wall time or clock time it takes to run the forecast model. And then on the uh, X axis here, you have basically the number of tasks or MPI tasks that we're using. And basically, uh, the take home point here is that the limited area configuration uses less than half the tasks that the nest needs for completing in the same amount of time. So it's a substantial savings if you're just wanting to run over the same area and for relatively short forecast lengths. So that can help save a lot of computational resources and get your results uh, turned around much, uh, much more quickly as well. For domains and resolutions, uh, out of the box, we're planning to provide a three kilometer, 13 kilometer and 25 kilometer predefined domains over the contiguous United States. CONUS domain. Um, some of the, uh, the coarser resolution domains there are just, uh, it's, it's a nice um, framework and way to do some quick testing, quick turnaround, just to make sure you've got all the nuts and bolts set up and configured correctly, as well as if you want to run on a perhaps less powerful uh, computing platform, such as perhaps a laptop. Uh, preliminary tools for users uh, will also be provided so that you can set up your own grid as well. If you're not interested in running over CONUS, and maybe you run a run over Hawaii, um, you will we'll be able to provide the tools to help you out with that. We'll also be providing a, a new, uh, highly uniform uh, way in which to define the computational 
uh, grid or the projection associated with the computational grid. Uh, so the uh, original version with the limited area configuration uh, used this mnemonic uh, grid. And uh, one characteristic or quality of it uh, was that the uh, grid spacing uh, or cell size was tended to be coarser in the center of the domain. And then as you got towards the edges of the corners domain, the cell sizes got to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more fine resolution. So uh, there was a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the cell size, a lot of variation there. So maybe about 3.2 kilometers in the center to about 2.7 kilometers near the corners there. Um, with the newer uh, extended Schmidt mnemonic grid, uh, which will be a part of the release, um, that helps to make a much more homogeneous grid in such that uh, that cell size variation is minimized considerably. And so here you can see a near uniform distribution of about three kilometer cell sizes. Uh, there is a talk on this on Wednesday, um, which I encourage you to, to check out if you're interested in learning more. Um, so that's something we're particularly excited about. For physics suites, we'll be providing two and through the common community physics package ecosystem. Uh, we'll be providing the GFS suite as well as the rapid refresh forecast system beta suite. So the rapid refresh forecast system is the operational framework uh, that will be effectively underpinned by uh, the UFS short range uh, weather app. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in forthcoming slides. So uh, in this beta suite, uh, we'll be providing uh, Thompson Eid Hammer, that's the aerosol aware flavor of Thompson microphysics, MYNN boundary layer and surface parameterizations radiation uh, for short and long wave would be RRTMG. Uh, NOAA MP for the land surface model, and we won't be providing any parameterized deep convection uh, since the rapid refresh forecast system is intended to be a convection allowing uh, system. For the workflow, the workflow here really um, refers to all the glue components, uh, which are very important um, and can be somewhat technical uh, in how everything's put together. Uh, and this manages, uh, you know, from everything from the build and the compile and build and compile steps, which uh, for this will be an umbrella CMake based build system. Uh, if you're curious about how that works, uh, there is a talk, I believe this afternoon at 3 p.m. on the uh, cloud session uh, on the umbrella based CMake, umbrella based CMake build system for all the components. Um, it also includes end-to-end uh, -end execution with tax, task management. Here we're using Rakoto for that. So if you're uh, familiar with Rakoto, you know that it can handle uh, task dependencies. So if you have the pre-processing task is finished, it'll set up and submit your forecast job to your uh, whatever schedule you're using on your high performance computing platform. And while that forecast is running and uh, forecast output files are popping up in your directory, it'll start spinning off post-processor jobs and things like that. So it really handles uh, how all these tasks are interconnected. So here it's connecting all the pieces and all the dots involved with pre-processing from getting initial and lateral boundary conditions. And here we're supporting uh, GFS inputs, but as well as for RAP and NAM inputs as well. So if you want to run with initial conditions from those systems, you're certainly uh, welcome to do so. Uh, handling, it also handles model execution, as I said, post-processing with the unified post. We'll also be providing scripts for basic graphics with Python. So uh, you know, just uh, simple, you know, uh, scripts that you can view the forecast output um, and make sure that everything is working correctly. And then of course, you know, these scripts can be built upon by the user. So if they want to start adding and modifying uh, to that script and making it their own, they're certainly welcome to do so. In terms of platform supported, um, NOAA R&D, uh, HPC systems, high performance computing systems, as well as the operational high performance computing systems, uh, NCAR Cheyenne, NSSL's Odin machine, uh, the Exceed, or at the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center, or NSF uh, Stampede 2, um, and your Linux machine or Mac OS system. Um, so note that these are kind of uh, supported at a variety of sort of tiers. Some are fully pre-configured pre -configured out of the box. You know, there's already libraries and whatnot existing on that system, so it makes setting it up much uh, more straightforward. Um, so. Uh, so those are the systems there. One thing I really want to note, and I'm kind of putting on my environmental modeling center, center hat here just a little bit, um, is the connection to the operational HPC uh, system. So, uh, you know, if I'm working on a model implementation, say it's the RRFS, uh, it makes the barrier to entry one uh, quite low for just, uh, you know, all of our collaborators, if they can work one with the with an easy to use workflow, but also the barrier to entry to getting something in from research into operations if we're using the same framework. And that includes uh, things like the workflow as well. So uh, it's something I really wanna highlight that we'll be using and working with essentially the same configurations and the same systems. And I think that's a, a tremendous advantage uh, in the R2O paradigm going forward. For user support. Yes, go ahead. Two more minutes. 
Okay, thank you. So for user support, we have end-to-end -end documentation, just kind of showing an example of that there, uh, utility scripts for verifying your configuration. There's a forum uh, available as well. Uh, uh, and uh, Ubro has participation from experts and we can help, uh, and hopefully through that forum, we can build knowledge within the community. So how does the UFS short range weather app fit into the NSEP production suite? So here's a current snapshot of the regional modeling suite. Um, it's somewhat complex. We have the global applications here up top, the regional applications here, uh, somewhat continental scale, uh, you know, 12 to 13 kilometers or 12 to 15 kilometers of wrap, shrep, and NAM. And then we have these high res, uh, high res windows and convection allowing type configurations of the NAM nest and her, uh, which feed into HREF V2. And here we, we uh, are, just shows all the domains that we have to cover to provide uh, support for, for all the areas across the, the United States, which includes, you know, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico. Guam's not pictured, but we do provide coverage for that as well. So the question is, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we simplify? Well, the first thing that we're doing is something in the short term this winter, we're replacing the high-res window NMMB member with an FV3-based one and feeding that into HREF V3 and adding the herd to that. So that'll get us some short-term forecast improvement and also gets us a little bit of experience with FV3 at the convective scale in the production suite. But what I really want to focus is on is the transition from this slide to this one. So this one's pretty busy. It's rather complex. This one is far simpler. Um, here we have the GFS and the Global Ensemble Forecast System. We have our RRFS and then going down to Warn on Forecast. So Focusing on the RFS, it's intended to subsume uh, all the roles and uh, responsibilities of the RAP, NAM, SHREF, or NAM, NAST, and HREF. A lot of change uh, associated with that, and uh, there's a lot of work involved in coordinating that. So I don't want to get too uh, bogged down in the details there, especially because I have limited time left. So the question is, what is RFS and how do we get there? Getting there, a big part of that is the UFS short range weather app and getting involved, uh, getting the community involved uh, in this effort. So here's just an overview of what the rapid refresh forecast system is going to look like or what we're planning uh, for it to look like right now. Uh, FY23 or 2023 timeframe is what we're thinking about for implementation. It will be rapidly updated uh, based on the UFS short range weather app, convection allowing, uh, ensemble based data simulation approach, likely using a hybrid EN bar type of method with ensemble based forecasts. And you can see the cadence here. What I want to point out is at the moment, this is the domain that we're considering. It's covered by this white outline. And this is a uh, three kilometer grid spacing. So we're trying to cover all of those uh, domains and areas that we currently cover with a variety of domains and different types of applications with one single unified domain going forward. So I'll end here with the UFS model of building better forecasts through community partnerships. Um, community and collaborative efforts are fundamental to the advancement of RFS and the production suite. And I really want to acknowledge uh, the UFS Short Range Weather App team. Um, they're an excellent group of scientists and software engineers and colleagues um, and just fantastic folks to work with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. We have time for at least one, maybe two quick questions. Wait, wait. Do you right. want to yeah, the first question is from Evan Kalina. The question is, an earlier speaker pointed out that the upcoming release of UFS Senior Weather will be the first UFS app to be released prior to an operational implementation. Going forward, do we expect the public releases of new app versions or new apps will come before their operational implementations? That's a great question. I can't personally speak to how uh, other apps are going to be uh, designed and put forward and released. I can speak a little bit, at least a little bit to the short range weather app. Part of the reason we did this is because uh, we had an opportunity um, and with the, and, and you know, strategically uh, with the way that our implementation moratoriums and whatnot were setting up and we were going to get our new compute infrastructure in place uh, for operational uh, purposes. Um, we had time to get something out and release to the community uh, before we were uh, going to implement about, in this case, it's a, it's, a, it's about three years. Uh, so uh, that's something we were able to take advantage of and worked well for our schedule. Um, and, we're, and we're happy about that. We can, um, uh, why don't you read the question from Tara? We have yeah. That. yeah, question from Tara Jensen. Uh, what needs to happen to get MedPlus to be added to the workflow? That's another great question. Uh, we do have some efforts going on to get MetPlus added to the workflow. Uh, I don't think that we're there yet in having something ready for this release at this stage, but that's something we can certainly have more conversations about 
uh, offline. I mean, obviously verification is critical to any part of uh, model development. You need to know how well your forecast is doing in order to understand what you need to, to work on to improve it. Um, so that's something that we would very much like to work into the release. If not this one, then certainly the following one. All right, thanks. So um, in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next speaker, um, which is Abachal Mera, and he's going to be talking to us about the hurricane application. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Let me try to present my screen here. I can also see your screen. All right, great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about the hurricane application of the UFS. Uh, which we call Hurricane Analysis and Forecast System, or HAFS for short. Uh, my co-authors uh, on this presentation are uh, Dr. Shujin Zhang from AML HRD and uh, Vijay from EMC. There are also a ton of contributors as listed here. Um, so this is truly a community effort. Uh, more about that later. Uh, here's a brief outline of the topics I plan to cover. I'll start with an introduction uh, to halves, uh, talk a little bit about our objectives and the strategy we are, we are adopting, uh, talk about uh, our accomplishments um, from year one of halves development, and then talk about the plans for the ongoing year two and uh, end with the long-term vision. Uh, so uh, this is truly a collaborative project. Um, we are all working within the UFS framework. And uh, right now there are uh, seven different organizations involved in uh, developing this application, uh, namely uh, EMC at NCEP, uh, HRD at AOML, uh, GFDL, uh, Israel, uh, two groups at Israel, um, uh, AOC, as part of OFCM, as well as uh, NCAR and DTC. So in terms of our um, uh, objectives here, um, so HAFS is viewed as an FE3-based um, multi-scale model and data assimilation system, which is capable of providing tropical cyclone um, analyses and forecasts of the inner core structure and the large-scale environment. Uh, so, uh, we are hoping to target uh, such a system uh, for uh, the benefit of hurricane forecast forecasters and give them reliable, robust, and skillful guidance on uh, track and intensity, uh, including rapid intensification, which, has, which is an ongoing challenge, along with information on storm size, uh, genesis, uh, the longer uh, lead times, and eventually also includes storm surge, inundation, uh, rain, and rainfall um, uh, information or preset information. Uh, so we are hoping to deploy cutting edge research um, uh, for tropical cyclone modeling, uh, physics, uh, data simulation, as well as coupling to other earth system components, uh, mainly oceans and waves for now, and uh, provide high resolution tropical cyclone predictions uh, as outlined in the uh, SIP objectives, which Ricky talked about earlier in the morning uh, within the UFS framework. So moving on to what we uh, were able to do in year one, uh, briefly, uh, we were able to establish a code repository for HAFS, and we have active management, bringing in changes and advancements. Uh, we have a workflow uh, where, which we can deploy um, for both uh, real time as well as for development purposes. Uh, we tried uh, a couple of HAFS configurations, more on that later. Um, we have a capability to now have multiple static nests uh, within HAFS. Uh, this is a step towards uh, moving 
uh, to uh, having moving nests, uh, which is how we uh, do our current hurricane operations. And uh, we also worked on the physics aspects. And now we are able to um, use HWARF based physics uh, within the CCTP. Here. So in terms of uh, code repository and management, um, we are incorporating the three-tier repository structure, uh, whereby we have an authoritative house repository, uh, right now maintained at EMC. And then we have trusted community organizational uh, half sports, uh, where we are able to provide community support and promote organizational level collaborations. And then we also have half developer ports. So uh, here, and the schematic here on the right is uh, the Git flow rationale, which we have adopted. And, uh, we essentially adop adopted the common branch naming convention used in Git flow, where we have develop for the develop branch, master for uh, master branches, and then feature, uh, where we are trying to develop uh, specific things. In terms of uh, workflow, uh, we we, the workflow uh, is already capable of supporting uh, the SAR or standalone regional, now also referred to as limited area model configuration of FE3. Uh, we can also support having nests uh, within the globe configuration as well. Uh, we're using Rokoto uh, for our management and uh, Python and shell based scripts for individual task components. Uh, we are maintaining a flexible domain setup. Uh, whereby if needed, we can do domain shifts on a cycle by cycle basis. Uh, we are supporting uh, WCOS, our production machine, as well as uh, all the RDH, PCS, or the NOAA R&D platforms, namely JET, Hera, and Orion. And uh, we have the ability to do continuous day-to-day uh, -day runs, uh, even though there are no storms, uh, or we launch with uh, with NHC storm message triggering like we typically do right now in our operations. So in terms of the configurations we tried in year one, uh, the shown here on the left is the LAM or the standalone regional version where we had a nest of, uh, we had a standalone region of three kilometers uh, covering the North Atlantic basin. And on the right is a similar configuration but nested within the global model. Uh, both uh, the blue domains here are the active domains at three kilometer. The global was at 13 kilometer. Uh, the two domain sizes were very similar. Uh, the one on the left uh, was 85 by 56 degrees. The one on the right was 85 by 45 degrees. Here is an animation for one of the runs. This is from the uh, standard or regional or the limited area model for uh, Hurricane Dorian. Uh, this was uh, cycle initialized on 30th August uh, 6E. And uh, this is a typical example of what we found with halves, whereby we got better forecast track scale as compared to our uh, operational models. And uh, halves, uh, both configuration of halves were able to pick up on the right turn of Dorian um, before the operational models uh, uh, honed on that. So some of the lessons learned from these real-time experiments uh, showed us um, that uh, the results uh, indicated uh, smaller track errors and better track scale as compared to operational models, uh, uh, which was very encouraging. Uh, results, uh, in a sense, from both configurations were very similar, out to five days. Um, the version 0.p, which is uh, global with nests, remains our long-term goal, our long-term target. Um, but we do have to worry about impact of feedback from nests back onto the global model, uh, which uh, remains an open science question and uh, uh, an area of active research. The 0.8 configuration or the limited area model is obviously computationally cheaper, I believe uh, by a factor of 2.5. It also provides for ease of use and close collaborations with uh, the FE3 LAM developments, uh, which uh, Jacob discussed in his last talk. This includes um, sharing uh, expertise on physics, on data assimilation, as well as other utilities for pre, pre and post processing. Uh, but um, both these configurations are relatively more expensive than existing operational models. 
So as such, uh, moving forward, we need to consider optimum configurations, um, especially with moving nests for uh, targeted initial operational capability. So moving on to year two uh, planning, uh, some of the focus areas are listed here. Uh, we plan to accelerate uh, the development of multiple telescopic moving nests uh, within uh, within FE3 for use with halves. Uh, we're pursuing coupling to ocean, uh, high common in this case, using the uh, uh, CMEPS uh, mediator and new op sea layers. Uh, we plan to test further the HWAR physics suite, now that is available within CCPP, as well as consider other uh, suites available um, uh, uh, if within, within CCPP. Uh, another thing which we are exploring is use of advanced vertex initialization methods and also uh, consider inner core DA algorithms, which uh, 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 are already there in our operational models and need to be repurposed within apps. And like last year, we hope to explore our performance for uh, multiple apps configurations um, uh, via HWIP uh, real-time experiments. Uh, so this is a schematic of showing uh, developments with the moving nest. So some of the things in this context have been completed, uh, shown in green. Uh, FMS, which is the framework for building these moving nests within FE3, uh, modifi the modifications have been done. As I mentioned, we, are, we can now uh, generate uh, and maintain multiple static nests. Uh, the moving nest utilities, uh, which, in, which involve things like grid transformation, interpolation, memory shifting, and uh, hollow exchange uh, for input and output, and coupling between the parent and the nest domain is also complete from an engineering aspect. Uh, we're working on a dynamic, high efficient vortex tracking system for the moving nests, and also working on uh, dicore and physics uh, tests and evaluations with it. And of course, uh, uh, also on pre-processing and initialization of the moving nests. After that, we hope to explore inner core DA uh, as well as coupling to uh, oceans and waves uh, for these moving nests. Two minutes, Avatar. Sure. So, talking about coupling, um, sorry. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are working on coupling halves with uh, HiCom. Uh, this is using the Neopsy architecture, uh, using the CMAPS mediator. Uh, this is work in progress. Um, also, uh, uh, we are conducting, uh, uh, we have conducted a lot of dynamics and physics experiments with HAFs, including those involving uh, use of higher horizontal uh, resolution, higher vertical resolution. Um, Zach will be talking about this uh, in his talk later. Uh, alternate mnemonic grids, <clears throat> as described by Jacob. Uh, for physics, we are looking at scale-aware cumulus convection and a number of CCPP options, including microphysics update, uh, YSU PBL, TKE EDMF PBL schemes as well, and uh, coupling uh, using CMAPS. So here's an example of uh, improvements we saw with a higher horizontal resolution. Uh, this is for Hurricane Michael for a cycle uh, shown in the animation on the left. On the right, as you can see, the yellow curve depicts the results with the 1.5 kilometer, which gave us the best intensity forecast for this particular cycle. In terms of uh, uh, vortex initialization, we are working on a GSI-based uh, relocation methodology, um, as described here in the schematic. Uh, so essentially, the idea is to use ocean relative observations um, uh, from the previous uh, six hour forecast of halves, and then uh, assimilate those points um, uh, using GSI to relocate the vortex for the subsequent cycle. So, some of the planned uh, 2020 halves real time experiments uh, uh, include continuing with our limited area model with ocean coupling, continuing with our global with nests. We are also uh, planning to have the first ensemble prediction system. Uh, using HAFs for limited area model configuration in the North Atlantic Basin. And we are also trying out a new uh, extended Schmidt mnemonic grid, which gives us a uniform grid across the basin for both the North Atlantic and the Northeast Pacific basins. 
Uh, here is a list of all the house related presentations at this workshop. Uh, there are a number of them uh, today, tomorrow, as well as on Wednesday. And finally, I would just like to end with uh, this slide, which shows our long term goal of having uh, uh, moving nested grids uh, following individual storms. Uh, in this case, uh, five, five storms shown here uh, embedded all within the global model. That's a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Avichal. We have uh, time for at least one question for Avichal. Yeah, I think these two questions are connected. So the first question is from Ben Cash. How much overlap is there between the current short range weather and half workflow? And then there's another question from Iman Gohari. It's kind of an extensive version of this question. So how much overlap are between short range weather halves and UFS workflows in general? Um, so what I can tell you is that uh, because the hurricane application brings with it some unique needs uh, like vortex initialization and uh, inner core within the vortex data simulation, those are two examples, uh, there will be differences in the workflow uh, with the short range weather, but we are repurposing all the tools and utilities which we would otherwise need in context of the UFS um, uh, uh, workflows. Meaning that wherever possible, we are repurposing the same utilities, the same tools uh, which are being used across different UFS applications. So there is a repository called UFS Utils and uh, we, we try and repurpose those and use those as much as possible in the HAFS workflow as well. And we, we maintain uh, uh, both for the dynamic core as well as for our physics experiments using CCPP. We are synced up in that sense as to whatever uh, 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 specific modules are available within the UFS repositories, we, we use them for HAFS as well. Hope that helps. Yeah, that does. Thank you, Ocha. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll need to move on to the next speaker. And that's Tim Fuller Robo. Um, and he will be talking on the space weather um, application team work. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Tim, and I can see your slide. Oh, you can? Oh, okay. Um, so I need to just tell me if it goes full screen. Is that full screen? Yes, it is. Yeah. And I Good. will pop in and give you a, a warning at 10 minutes. I'll turn my camera on briefly. And so that's that's at your 10 minute mark. OK, Great. thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity for introducing the, the Space Weather app to the uh, UFS community is probably not familiar with everybody. It's made up of a whole atmosphere model, which was an extension of the, the old enthalpy GSM version of the weather model. It extended that up to 600 kilometers altitude. Well, it, about that, it, it expands and contracts, of course, as it heats and cools. There's a plasma component called IPE, and then uh, the WDAS is the, the data assimilation component with the lower atmosphere. I did want to just recognize the, the teams at um, EMC and, and at Series Switzy. Um, Henry and Mark and Morphe have been, was, um, were involved in the very development of WAM originally more than, more than 10 years ago, and Sajal joined the team more recently at, uh, at Switzy. I also wanted to recognize Rashid Akhmav. He did a lot in the original development of the whole atmosphere model, unfortunately. He, he, uh, he died recently. Um, uh, Sue is in, um, managing the, the transition and Naomi is the IPE developer. Uh, Ju Xiao has taken over con, um, the upper atmospheric physics part that Rashid was working on. Adam's doing the, the workflow and Raphael is doing the, uh, the space weather me mediator. I'm just going to skip the next slide. So why are we um, why is the space weather app part of the UFS? Well, the, um, there's a lot of wave sources from the lower atmosphere that influence space weather. So there's rather a new paradigm for space weather. It's not just uh, the, the sun and the, up and the magnetosphere that's driving space weather. It's also the lower atmosphere because a lot of the 
um, things like the migrating tides from the absorption of the ultraviolet from, by ozone in, in the middle atmosphere that generates uh, migrating tides that propagate up into the lower thermosphere where the, the plasma starts to be important and the collisions between the neutrals and the plasma are important and so it starts to drop the winds start to drive uh, the, a dynamo effect and they drive electric fields and then those electric fields push the plasma around and keep and create the structure in the plasma plasma there's also uh, tropical convection can impose a longitude signature say a four wave signature in the troposphere and when that's modulated by a um, the diurnal heating and cooling, the, uh, it generates uh, non-migrating tides, which again can propagate up into the upper upper thermosphere and ionosphere, and produce uh, um, and move the plasma around yet again, drive the dynamo effects. During a sudden stratospheric warming, again the changes in all of those migrating and non-migrating tides can can change the the, the dynamo effects and changed the plasma by as much as 50%. And then there's this whole spectrum of waves that are coming up from the lower atmosphere, all the resolved waves, even at the fairly low resolution that we run the whole atmosphere model. And you can see that all the, the structure that you get in the vertical winds at about 300 kilometers altitude. And we believe that they're the cause of some of the driving some of the ionospheric irregularities. So there's lots of reasons why we need a whole atmosphere model, but of course, when the sun is active, uh, the, the changes that can be imparted in, the, in space weather due to the sun, there's a large change in the in extreme ultraviolet that can change the temperature by hundreds of degrees Kelvin at high, in the high altitudes. During a geomagnetic storm, when the, when the solar wind plasma ejected from the sun, if that uh, magnetic field in that plasma is pointed anti-parallel to the Earth's field, then the, a lot of that energy gets in and cre can create these huge changes in total electron content, which Im influence spa space weather applications. And a lot of the structure associated with those are also uh, impacting operational systems. So some of those operate, some of those parameters that we're trying to predict for the space weather application is uh, things like neutral density for satellite drag, fairly obvious one, in the ionosphere for HF communications, we need the ionosphere to reflect the HF communication signals from. And when you have uh, reductions or increases in that, you change the, the usable frequencies for communication. For GNSS, for things like the GPS positioning and satellite navigation and timing. <clears throat> Firstly, the, the, the total electron content delays the signals and refracts them. And the plasma irregularities in each structure cause the signals to be diffracted, causing amplitude and phase scintillations, and sometimes complete loss of the uh, the, the radio wave propagation. And the same applies to the the satellite uh, satellite communications as well, of course. So um, the the sort of three main components in the in the space weather app. The first is the whole atmosphere model, which uh, uh, originally developed uh, more than 10 years ago, and it's gradually been evolving. And it's based on the old enthalpy version of the global spectral model, not, not the FE3 just yet. That's the plan for the future. So it still has the hydrostatic dynamical core. We're running it at a fairly coarse resolution compared with the tropospheric weather simulations, numerical weather prediction, only at T62, which is only a, has just less than 200 kilometers um, horizontal lat long uh, spacing on, on the Gaussian grid. And in the dynamical core, we have the five species rather than the normal three species. And of course, the enthalpy um, thermodynamics and the, the multi species, because in the upper upper levels, those species can start to separate and not be so well mixed. So you can have variable specific heat and gas constant. And due to the extreme depth and the height of the, uh, the space weather application, we need to have the variable G. And so there's 150 levels with the top of the atmosphere extending um, to something like 600 kilometers for, for normal temperatures, but that height can increase to eight or 900 kilometers during a big geomagnetic. <laughs> and there's a bunch of additional 
uh, physical processes, of course, that we needed to add in from the, the absorption from the ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet, things like all, all of the, uh, the interactions with the plasma, with the iron drag and the dual heating, and the molecular and vertical, uh, sorry, the molecular dissipative and diffusion processes in the upper levels. <laughs> you can get rid of uh, the uh, the Rayleigh, Rayleigh damping and a lot, lot of the, the stability you can rely on the molecular diffusion pro processes. The, um, and the other com another component of the space weather application of course is the plasma component. Here that um, plasma component is on a very different uh, grid system than the normal lat long pressure grid from uh, from the whole atmosphere model. It's um, the, the Plasma is solved along the magnetic field lines, and it's not just an, a surface interface between the, the atmosphere, it's actually embedded, it's a 3D regridding that's needed to exchange the information between the plasma component and the neutral component, because the magnetic field is solved along these, mag uh, these magnetic flux tubes. So it's um, it can, the plasma start model starts at about 90 kilometers and goes up to 10,000. So there's an overlap between about 90 and 600 kilometers between the, the neutrals from the from the WAM neutrals and the IPE. And the, we use the International Geomagnetic Reference Coordinate System to represent it. This is the background uh, physics is the a field line in demonstrate physics model perpendicular e, e cross b transport across the whole globe you can get an idea of the the grid here mapped onto the geographic frame and uh, this is just some of some of the details there that we probably don't, don't need to go into so that's the plasma component and of course it needs to be coupled by this 3d regridding not just a surface exchange of, of information and the um that's done through the space weather mediator, a specialized neoxy mediator component that provides the can provides the bi-directional, three-directional mapping of the field exchange between the two models. At the moment, most of the information exchange is from the WAM, providing the uh, the dynamics, the temperature, and the neutral composition to the IPE for the space weather applications, because most of the space weather applications it starts apart from the density for satellite drag, come, come out as the output from the IPE, the ionosphere plasmas for electrodynamic component. So we use that space weather mediator also to provide the, the IO component uh, for the operational products. And of course, we need to have the lower atmospheric forcing and the solar forcing. And so there, there is another component that deals with the, the solar wind and um, <clears throat> solar radiative flux within the, within that mediator and the whole coupled system with the wham ipe and the 3d mediator is transitioned to operate transition to operations is slated for later this year and you can just see where the uh, wham ipe space weather app fits within the, the the usual framework of there's the atmospheric component of course that's the the older enthalpy based uh, GS, gsm there's the space weather mediator and the, and the space component is the ipe model <clears throat> So on to the, so the benefits of WAM, of course, uh, because it's compatible with the U.S. operational weather model and of the and the five species enthalpy thermodynamic version that is, we can implement we can embed it the whole atmosphere model in the GSI data assimilation system, which is the one we're currently using, and so we're using all the same data in the lower atmosphere, albeit at the lower. Uh, resolution of the uh, spectral resolution of T62. So it does mean that we're able to follow all of the same uh, weather events just as in the numerical weather prediction model and all of those effects in the lower atmosphere can propagate up to the thermosphere and impact the impact space weather. So a little bit about the workflow. We have um, two um, two CONOPS, what we call CONOPS, the concept of operations. One is based on the, the typical six hour cycling that um, most of you are probably familiar with, with the data assimilation. There are some differences because we, 
we used uh, incremental analysis update. I'll go into a little bit on that in just a second. And of course, we need to in include all of the space weather drivers coming from the sun. So we're using that six hour cycling. It, it's all like in the back, the background. But there's also a, a second uh, workflow that um, maintains the model closer to real time. Space weather driven by solar input happens very quickly. And so we can't rely on the forecast of a previous initialization to follow the space weather effects um, for the, uh, the solar driven component of, of the space weather because you can have rapid changes in just, just a, uh, one, or, one or two hours. And I'll describe that a little bit more detail here. So we're using, so the background is, is the normal six hour cycling. So some of the differences are we use the IAU to spread the increment across the six hour window. So we initialize the period not at the center of the window and with a with a big jump in the increment at that time, which would cause a lot of spurious gravity waves that would cause a lot of disruption of the an unrealistic response in the upper atmosphere. So we just spread the increment over the six hour assimilation window, initialize it at the beginning of the assimilation window. And, and and the other thing to note is that the um, at this this cycle would have happened say at about seven or eight um, UT um, when the data is available when that cycle happened and so that's that's the only time that the uh, space weather app is actually up with the Conops one it's the only time that the space weather app is actually in real time following both the lower atmospheric and the solar driven components because you have to wait another six hours before the data is available for the next cycle. So we're all a little bit behind in, in terms of the forcing from the, uh, from the sun and that which is represented by these black arrows as input here. And at some point in that previous cycle, that was the only time that the uh, solar data was available to drive the model and then it became a forecast. So we added on an additional, sorry, I'll just skip through those. There's an additional uh, CONOPS where at the same time that that forecast from this cycle one is move, moves forward and does, a, does the forecast, we pick up that um, the state at the end of the, uh, the corrector segment and move it forward while the solar wind data is available. And then, of course, you get up to real time and the data is no longer available, so it has to wait. And then it, uh, when that new data comes available, it will step forward in time and then it'll have to wait again. And so then it eventually, so it, it manages to follow the solar driven component to make it much closer to real time if there is a geomagnetic storm. And then eventually the uh, next cycle comes along and the process uh, it repeats itself. Tim, we so, need to wrap up your presentation. Thanks. Sorry, yeah, just in the summary. Um, yeah, so space weather in the neutral upper atmosphere and ionosphere in the plasma is not only driven by the solar variability, all the tides and gravity waves from the lower atmosphere can drive the dynamics and uh, in the dynamo region can drive the electrodynamics and all the plasma variations in the upper atmosphere. <clears throat> so the space weather combines that whole atmosphere component, which is the extension of that enthalpy based GF, uh, GSM, a plasma component and the 3D, 3D degridding component and the WDAS data assimilation system. We're going to be moving on, hopefully there is a, onto the FB3 and the FB3 WAM non-hydrostatic core is currently under development at EMC and, um, and Henry Wang is, is presentation at 2.20 today in the model dynamics, physics and air quality session is talking about that that will be the next step of developing the FV3 WAM. So I hope, hope that gives you a little bit of idea about what the Space Weather app is and why it's connected to the UFS uh, community. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tim. Um, so we're out of time for Tim's slot, so we're gonna need to move on to the next um, speaker. I'd encourage people to put questions in the Slack channel if you have a question for Tim, and then Tim can um, try and answer those there. So our next speaker is Andre van der Westhausen. I hope I didn't butcher that too much. Um, and, he, 
and he is going to um, give us a presentation on the coastal application team's work. All right, thank you very much. Can you all see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just minimize. And I will pop in and give you a warning at your 10 minute mark. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. So I'm presenting on behalf of uh, my uh, my co-authors, Pat Burke, Derek Snowden, and Shark Peary. Um, and the work that we present here on the coastal application, or coastal applications, plural, um, represents work done in three line offices of NOAA, plus um, international collaboration with, uh, with Canadians. So, um, so it's certainly a large uh, cross-cutting effort. And what I will do is I will I will motivate why we split our application essentially in in a 2D modeling framework and a 3D modeling framework, um, and then talk about how the components fit together in general as a as a general strategy. And then I'll highlight a number of uh, major applications that we have, um, the Coastal Act being one of them that uh, Andrew already mentioned earlier, um, and then the Coastal Act uh, or sorry the New Opsi Cap development that was um, involved in uh, building these systems and some examples. And then I'll close with a summary and outlook. I can get my mouse to work. Ah. So first of all, the in the coast we have a number of processes that are important, and one one uh, critical application, as we will start seeing in this hurricane season again, is uh, storm surge applications. And there we're considering uh, things like wave and surge coupling, so top left there. Compound flooding, where we add in the the river component, and uh, Hurricane Harvey recently um, and Florence told us that this is extremely important to have that component in there. Also, when you look at the Arctic areas, Alaskan areas, you also need to include ice uh, interaction. Uh, the picture there shows you what what looks like when storm surge freezes in um, in a community. So you essentially have storm surge frozen in place. So for this type of application, we really focus on the horizontal resolution to be able to capture these kind of scales you see in these images. We need to go down to scales of uh, 50 to 100 meters. So essentially we have to kind of buy that in the horizontal by not focusing really on the vertical. And the processes we are modeling here, um, short uh, wind-driven waves, coastal surge, riverine, um, these are things you can model in 2D. So we, we save we save one dimension and we focus on the horizontal. Also important to include all of the details such as uh, federal, non-federal levies. Um, really key here is that there's a lot of uncertainty still coming from the atmosphere when you have tropical storms. So probabilistic approaches are extremely important here. This is a, a big point always made by the Hurricane Center. The operational turnaround time should be in the order of less than 16 minutes and of course numerically stable under all conditions. Uh, we also have a need for bias correction here and that is because things like steric effects are not explicitly modeled in these systems since they're very tropic um, and so that is typically addressed with bias correction. On the 3D side we have also a number of applications mostly on the National Ocean Service and GLURL side for example, emergency response with uh, with hazardous fluids, precision navigation, where vertical levels are really important, but including salinity uh, impacts on that. Water quality, very important in the Great Lakes, for example, like Erie here, uh, and also things like fish stock assessments. This is the component that is um, less clearly defined yet in terms of um, the exact systems that need to be included um, essentially, as we say, the, the spatial scales, the temporal resolutions, even the metrics and operational turnaround time. But we know the application areas, US coastlines, the Great Lakes. And as we are working to crystallize the applications and the needs, um, these will become clear. But this is the component that is still essentially a work in progress for us in terms of the US phase. However, in terms of how the systems uh, fit together, this is already a, a quite a clear picture. And so this is the general strategy that we that we have. Starting on the left-hand side, we have the numerical weather model. So this would be a general circulation model or it would be a hurricane model. Um, and it, would, uh, it, it provides us wind and pressure and precipitation. Um, and then that goes into the three main systems that we have currently within the coastal environment. So a wind wave model, 
the coastal ocean model, either 2D or 3D, um, and then the in inland hydrology models. And this can be supplemented in, uh, in Alaskan areas, for example, with the sea ice model you see there in the top right. So the main interaction is between the wave model, coastal model, and the inland hydrology model, uh, exchanging things like wave stresses, water levels, currents, discharges, and, and water levels again. And then with the atmospheric model, the coupling can either be a one-way in terms of a data cap, or a two-way where things like uh, sea surface temperature can go back into the atmospheric model. But essentially, this is the component on the far left where, for example, we would be interfacing in future with models such as the HABs, which I've uh, just covered. So these, these couple systems in the middle, then they, they output water levels, currents, wave spectra, et cetera, for all of the applications you see there towards the right. So inundation, navigation, water quality, sediment transport, et cetera, which goes to the end user. So right now we have a number of major applications which we're still working to integrate into a more unified system. The one that is the most mature and the most integrated is the one at the top, the Coastal Act. So that's a 2D wave, system, a wave surge river system, which is uh, for a high class application. That's called the name storm event model. Um, that's 2D. Um, then we have two forecast uh, type applications which are supported by Larkin Supplemental. One again with at circuit wave watch forced by a parametric wind model, the famous Holland B model. So that's a wave surge system for ensembles. So that's clearly a, a, a tropical system application uh, uh, target. And then the uh, coupling with the national water model at circuit wave watch. Uh, where we bring in the river component in a 2D sense. So these are the 2D applications which are working to unify. Then towards the bottom we have um, 3D applications. Uh, two of them are from GLURL, so these are Great Lakes applications. National Water Model EFICOM WaveWatch 3, um, and that's for um, a, a pilot case in Lake Champlain. And then there's a component, uh, a system which also brings in the, the sea ice component in general for circulation in the Great Lakes. So Avicom, Waywatch 3 and sea ice. Then again on the National Ocean Service side, uh, we have two systems that incorporate ROMs um, and either 4D VAR data simulation or coupling with, with HWARF. So in the, in the coming slides, I will provide a bit more detail uh, into some of these systems. So the types of development that we've uh, made to the CAP and to the component systems um, are listed here, really important uh, developments we made. First of all, we optimize unstructured WaveWatch 3 to be able to be efficient in the coastal applications, uh, which included an um, uh, implicit scheme um, uh, conversion of the system and domain decomposition. So on the right hand side you see the, the typical um, unstructured mesh that we use for, uh, for applications in tropical areas for AdCERC and for WaveWatch. So that's not possible with WaveWatch. The existing NUOPSI cap of WaveWatch was extended to be uh, to operate for unstructured. Um, there was a cap written specifically for AdCERC um, to be able to interface with WaveWatch. Um, and there was also a data cap written to get data uh, from atmospheric models in a, in a data cap sense. Then currently under development is a new OPSI cap for national water model, a new OPSI cap for uh, WARF and ROMs, and then also a cap for FECOM. So a lot of cap development to support the, uh, the applications considered here. So as I mentioned, the Coastal Act is the one that's the most mature in terms of a UFS coupling application. Uh, so this is a coupling between AdCERC and WaveWatch 3. Um, the purpose for this is a very high resolution hindcast application for these uh, post-storm assessments that we're um, doing um, for FEMA under a congressional mandate. The coupling from atmosphere is one way, like I mentioned, the data cap, two-way interaction between AdCERC and WaveWatch, and soon also three-way three -way interaction with the National Water Model. All of these codes are uh, on GitHub, as well as the workflow, including the automated validation that we have for the system. And the system is uh, planned for implementation in FY22. Here is just a, a quick example of what uh, the output looks like of this uh, coupled system for the Coastal Act. So we have uh, wave components, water level components, and atmospheric data components. Here you see an example of the wave fields created uh, by the system. This is for Hurricane Ike, which uh, made landfall in Galveston. So on the left-hand side, you see the significant wave heights entering uh, into the Gulf of Mexico just now, right now. And on the bottom left, you see the high resolution Galveston Bay. And on the right, you see the delta, 
between a standalone wave, uh, wave heights and coupled wave heights. And in the bottom left, pay attention, you'll see now inundation plus waves um, in Galveston Bay area. So that is, uh, that is new to our uh, storm surge system. Right now, we still don't have coupling in this sense. And so this is the, the big benefit of this coupling system um, for our future operations, and in this case, for high cost application. So moving forward, we have a number of other applications, like I mentioned, AdCirc, WaveWatch, plus a parametric uh, wind model. So essentially, this is very similar to what I just showed, but it's a forecast application. And instead of having a model providing or a dynamic model providing the atmospheric forcing in a one-way sense, this is with parametric model based on best track data. This application is where we add in the national water model, so this collaboration with the Office of Water Prediction, so uh, three-way interaction between national water model, AdCirc, and WaveWatch, and then forcing with GFS or HWARF. Moving on to the rivers, this is uh, another example, again, quite similar to the previous ones, but here the coupling is with the national water model and FECOM. So in this case, we have 3D um, uh, circulation interacting with WaveWatch and the rivers. Two minutes more for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, then I think maybe I will just first skip the next two. So, so just briefly, I'll mention that um, the for for from IUS we have the so-called coastal and ocean modeling testbed, and there have been a number of projects that have come available from that, which now focuses on. Um, coupling with rivers, so again with, within a UFS framework together with a number of university partners. Um, the first of these products to come available and be incorporated into operations at NOS is the West Coast Operational Forecast System. Um, there are applications, like I mentioned, with H4 coupling with ROMs, and in this case we managed to model uh, significant salinity drops during uh, tropical events, for example, here, Hurricane Matthew. And in addition to these examples, there are six other projects that are being um, uh, worked on by university partners within the US um, in, the, in the context of coupling. So I'll just move here to my conclusions. Uh, within the coastal environment, we have a number of uh, coupling projects currently underway, and our strive is to unify these further to, to come up with a more limited set of um, potentially one or two uh, coastal coupling um, applications. And the clear division at this point seems to be a 2D versus a 3D type of applications based on the specific needs. So for storm surge, for the storm surge problem, it's, it's quite clear that 2D is um, the most optimal way to move forward. So in this case, um, this drives, this is driven by the need of high resolution and a large number of ensembles, my point two and point three there. Um, however, we do face limited resources um, in, in this realm of coastal storm surge modeling, and so that can be addressed either by optimization of the modeling components, as we did for WaveWatch 3, for example, or, if possible, increased resources moving forward. Um, and as Avichal already mentioned, um, it's the, the long-term goal to incorporate this modeling into the into the have storm search component um, as an end game of this development. So looking at the 3D components, um, as mentioned, further coordination is, is needed to finalize exactly what the 3D application would look like. Um, it, there are a number of systems that I mentioned here which are not yet in the, um, in the approved modeling framework um, uh, of, of the UFS, so those would probably need to be incorporated. And then a good strategy needs to be developed um, specifically for this uh, 3D modeling component. In two more items, it, it needs to um, integrate the existing um, data simulation. So as I mentioned, the 4D bar, need to incorporate these capabilities into the marine JEDI. Um, and uh, as we are talking about um, community outreach, um, we also need to align these operational um, work, uh, this operational work with the GoDay Ocean View, Ocean Predict um, effort, which is an international collaboration. Thank you. That's what I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, it looks like we have one question from Arun. Weiwei, do you want to yeah. settle? Yeah, there's a one question from Arun Chawla. So uh, he asked, since half plans to include wave coupling, why not add surge model like AD CERC 
so as to have a coupled wave surge system for forecast as well. And he, he keeps asking, understand that we need a higher resolution for hindcast, but do we have surge flooding be part of half system as well? And uh, the follow-up question is, would NWPS and as to OFS be merged for a single coastal forecasting system? Yeah, thanks, Arun. Good question. So, so yes, the the first part of your question, the it it is explicitly the idea to uh, to have a, a merge down the road between these activities, at least the two D surge activities, and the halves model. So, so the the halves model has been it, it's been recognized from the beginning that uh, there is a storm surge component that needs to be developed for that, and really how we see the 2D component of what I presented here is to eventually merge into that effort so that the what I presented here, the data, the, the data cap, the atmospheric cap will ultimately become the HAVS model, the atmospheric aspect of it. Um, and the surge aspect will be WaveWatch 3 and AdCERC on unstructured measures to provide that high resolution by the coast. Um, and as to your second um, part of your question, uh, yes, so so once we get to that stage where we have um, an integrated system um, for tropical, that would be halves, and for extratropical, that would be AdCERC, WaveWatch, and the National Water Model. Once we have those systems in place, that essentially can take the place of what we currently know as, as NWPS and, uh, and the ESTOF systems. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Andre. We'll move on to our last speaker of the session, Ivanka Schoner, um, and she's going to talk to us about the air quality application. Um, and I'm hoping we have it worked out. Yes, looks like we do. Okay. Um, all right, Ivanka, I'll, I'll pop in at 10 minutes to give you a warning. Okay. Um, I can see your screen. If that's just, I'm just trying to hide this. Um, okay. Um, so, good afternoon at this point. Um, I will be talking about uh, what's on the program is the last two of this application uh, for air quality. Uh, I'd like to give credit to my uh, co-authors uh, who are uh, co-leading the, the air quality application team with me, uh, listed on this slide. Uh, and we are talking about air quality from about a day to week, and, and we are going to try to go into, into monthly uh, timescales. Um, so why, why air quality? Um, so societal impacts, impacts of weather and air quality are, are compared in these uh, figures. Um, it's, what, is, what is shown is the mortality uh, for different types of weather event, events and quality as well. Um, so in red, you have weather events, and if you sum them all up, you get about 500 or so uh, cases of, of mortality per year. Uh, while uh, the mortality for um, air quality is way higher, going over 100,000 people per year. So I just want to point out that this uh, slide on the left, uh, the, the figure on the left is really plotted in the log scale in order to be able to, to compare uh, the, the mortality cases. And when you look at on, on the linear scale, really the only thing you can see uh, is the air quality. So that's why we do air quality. Um, and, and who, who are our customers? Uh, so um, the main customers for weather service air quality forecast guidance are state and local air quality environmental agencies who then issue the official air quality forecast for their respective areas. Um, our uh, forecast guidance is also used by general public uh, and by our partner agencies, uh, CDC and EPA. Um, for uh, air quality uh, predictions in the United States, the requirements for that were developed a long time ago, over 15 years ago. Uh, and there's a list of, of uh, needs by our partners. And we are still going down that list and, and checking off things. And we still have a few things to, to complete uh, by, by that list that was developed uh, over 15 years ago. Uh, to provide uh, ozone and, and uh, PM 
um, guidance for the next uh, year, a uh, day or two, and now we want to go into three three days, and we want to also increase the, the resolution um, of these grids. Um, so, um, how is air quality forecasting done? Unlike, say, weather forecasting in the U.S., where um, NOAA has a large role um, both in the in the uh, gathering of the observations, in development and running of the models and in issuing of the official forecast. Um, in, in contrast, uh, air quality forecasting is a highly uh, collaborative uh, process uh, that we work with our partners from state and local agencies and from EPA, and everybody has a role in collecting the data, organizing the data, developing and running the models, and then, and then uh, posting, um, creating the official uh, forecast and then posting it uh, and distributing. Um, so uh, what are we doing currently? Uh, these are some of the selected examples of the ongoing development efforts uh, in the air quality area. Uh, so we, we have a project that's uh, we're looking at the aerosol feedbacks uh, from medium range uh, to, to uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. Uh, we are working on AOD, um, aerosol optical depth assimilation. Uh, we are working on high resolution modeling and trying to do that in line uh, together with, with the assimilation of data. Um, so the, these are mostly NOAA-funded efforts. Uh, EPA also has efforts uh, work, working on improving uh, the modeling of, of ozone and aerosols and improving the, the inventory. And then there are other partners. NASA is also having, having some uh, development uh, ongoing. Uh, so this is, these are some of the existing capabilities. Uh, I want to highlight uh, guest aerosol. Uh, which is a new development slated to go operational uh, in, in the fall of this year. It is based on a uh, go-kart um, um, aerosol uh, module um, coupled into uh, gas meteorology in a, into a, in, in a single member. Um, and uh, there is a number of improvements uh, in this model from the currently uh, operational uh, NGAC uh, model. Um, this is uh, an example of the improvements that you can see on the top. Uh, what you see here is the variability of, um, of AOD. Uh, as observed in this uh, red uh, marks, uh, it's showing the ARNS observations. And you can see um, the um, guest aerosol uh, member is shown in this golden color and tends to track the variability really well compared to the currently operational uh, model that is shown in, in the green on the bottom. Um, and you can see that that is not just for one single um, station, which this happens to be in, in Gabon in, in Africa. Uh, when you look at across all the Aeronet stations, uh, you can see that the correlation coefficients for the new model shown in red are way better, way higher than the, for the currently operational NGAC model. Um, so uh, we have model improvements here. We, we, we get a better representation of both the uh, mean fields and the variability uh, that you can, you can see on this slide. Uh, even uh, for the extreme cases like the uh, wildfires that were burning in, in uh, Australia this, uh, this January, um, there were uh, huge um, uh, AOD um, values uh, seen, seen in our uh, model prediction. Um, moving on to uh, the next thing that we want to do uh, in, in the area of the global modeling for aerosols, uh, we want to unify the repository for go-kart uh, with the one that is being uh, maintained at NASA. Uh, so the new repository will be having a shared process library that both NASA and NOAA will use the UFS uh, uh, will use as well. And it will have uh, different um, ways of interacting with the rest of the modeling system. So there is going to be a middleware that NASA is going to develop uh, for their piece. And then there will be a middleware uh, for NOAA, uh, which, which will also allow um, interaction uh, in interfaces to uh, CCPP physics. Um, 
Another thing that, is, that has just started is UFSR 2 project, and atmospheric composition is one of the components of the uh, medium-range weather uh, and end to uh, model development. Uh, in that team, we have uh, participants from a number of NOAA labs uh, and uh, also uh, from academia and cooperative institutes uh, supporting that. Uh, the main goal of that sub-project is to improve representation of aerosol di distribution um, and uh, initial inclusion of aerosol interactions with radiation on SOS timescales that are planned for GEF version 13. Um, so in GEF version 12, we have five-day predictions of aerosols. Here we're trying to uh, go all the way to S2S timescales and also include interactions with radiation. Um, another thing that is currently existing is the regional national air quality forecast capability. Uh, that is providing national predictions of ozone, smoke, dust, and PM2.5. Um, that has been developed since 2004, and now this is, this is the state uh, where we are. Um, I'd like to just show an example of how, how that works. Uh, so in addition to uh, the, uh, to, uh, the uh, predictions of uh, smoke plumes that are provided by high slip on, on the bottom uh, center, um, you can see uh, that we currently have the uh, GEFS aerosol that, that's being done, run in the test. Uh, uh, it was, it was uh, being done, uh, run, run for test and evaluation, and you can see also the, the, the plumes um, there on, on the top in the middle. And then this global GEFS aerosol system can also provide lateral boundary conditions for the CMAC model shown on bottom right. And you can see when those uh, lateral boundary conditions that include um, out of uh, domain uh, smoke contributions are included, you see the increase in, the, in uh, PM2.5 in the bottom part of the domain. And that really led to better agreement with the observed um, smoke and, and elevated PM2.5 that is shown uh, both on the top right and, uh, I'm sorry, on the top left and the bottom left. Um, so another uh, capability that is about to become operational is inclusion of smoke tracer in uh, wrap her system uh, that is uh, planned to uh, go operational sometime later this year as well. Um, CMEC is also a um, publicly available uh, system, uh, and uh, we benefit here from, from it being um, used for air quality assessments and regulatory actions, and uh, it, it's being um, actively developed and peer reviewed. Um, it has um, a um, public uh, GitHub repository. Uh, from which we can uh, get uh, the, the codes to use. And one of our uh, systems that, uh, one, one of our projects that is, that is using uh, that uh, repository in, in addition to the operations is this new um, project uh, funded by FY19 Disaster Supplemental, where we are including CMAC in line into LAM RFS model that. Uh, that Jacob was talking about uh, earlier today. Um, and we are using a column version of CMAC code uh, from the repository. We will be including also data assimilation there. Um, and in order to make uh, all of that uh, computationally feasible, we're actually developing a, a machine learning emulator for chemistry to make it uh, cheaper and, and have a more efficient code uh, to potentially run in the operation. Um, this is our so-called rainbow chart that shows a notional uh, schedule and, and plan for evolution from uh, the currently operational um, standalone models uh, on the left into uh, integrated UFS um, components of the larger models such as uh, GFS and GEFS and RFS, uh, and the products will be uh, coming from there. Uh, so we are looking to have a lot of our um, air quality um, 
modeling and products integrated into larger systems uh, by 2024. Uh, looking a little more broadly, um, we uh, for the air quality application, so we have uh, operations, de development, and research capabilities and goals. So uh, for the operations, we have air quality prediction for the U.S. that I have shown earlier. Uh, for global aerosol predictions, uh, we, are, we are looking to improve that in guest version 13 and include uh, feedback of aerosols and weather. Uh, we are moving to the uh, shared uh, repositories for codes across agencies. Uh, we're developing UFS air quality application that can be, then be used both for um, operations and uh, for the larger community use and, and comparison in evaluation of, of uh, new and better potentially um, models um, and uh, providing the chemical fields for, for uh, scientific studies that the, that the wider community could use. Uh, these are the uh, air quality application priorities uh, that we have um, shared uh, with the rest of the UFS community. Uh, so on the left, you can see the specific forecast scale priorities. Uh, we need to extend our air quality predictions to, to day three. We currently only go to day two. Uh, we need to improve the accuracy and, and location and timing uh, of air quality forecasts. And for that, we need high resolution um, um, forecast. Uh, we need to better represent uh, sources of pollution from wildfires and generally have more timely updates uh, of the pollutant emissions. Uh, we need to evaluate uh, impacts of atmospheric composition on uh, weather forecast skills, so we will be doing that for uh, GAPS version 13. Uh, and you can see that that is in accordance with uh, National Academy studies and on future um, of atmospheric chemistry research, where they really identify that as a priority to include atmospheric composition into weather and climate models. Uh, in addition to that, we would like to include uh, probabilistic uh, prediction, because most of our, all, all of our operational prediction is now uh, based on the um, single deterministic model. And then we have some, some uh, goals also of, of uh, integration and efficiency of these models. Uh, by including them into UFS, uh, by uh, establishing authoritative single authoritative repositories for shared codes, um, developing um, efficient uh, reduced form models, such as uh, machine learning based, and incorporating information from satellites and, and in situ sensors both into the um, emissions and into uh, data simulation of um, atmospheric composition. Uh, so that's all I have. I'd like to thank again uh, my co-authors and the wider um, air quality and, and uh, atmospheric composition team. Thanks. Thanks, Anaka. Um, so we're pretty much at our time limit. I was there a question for the air quality group? Wait, wait. I don't think so. Okay. All right. So it looks like we've used up all of our Q&A time frame. I'm sorry about that, everybody. Um, I'd like to encourage you we, that that's one of the reasons we put this Slack channel together. So if there are some questions that you want to share um, with the presenters, um, please enter them in there. And then I'd also encourage the, the presenters to go check that out and uh, carry on that dialogue there. So um, that's one one aspect of being virtual that's that's helpful. We can carry on those conversations even though we can't have a coffee break together. Um, and is there any announcements um, from the organizers before we go on break? Hey, Louisa, we're going to break and then um, we'll have those parallel sessions this afternoon. So hopefully everyone has a Google Meet links to connect to the four parallel sessions. If right. you don't, so we, yeah, go ahead. So I was going to say, so we're going to stop the um, go to meeting aspect and we'll move to Google Meet um, at two two ten Eastern time, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. 
I just wanted to mention that I just shared a screen that has the link to the full um, agenda that has all of the links. So if you don't have access to those already um, in your email, the password is Unified Capital U. And so that'll have all the links to the to the Google Meet um, sessions for the parallel sessions. Okay. Well, thank you to all the speakers again and uh, lots of information. Um, I see there is a fair bit of dialogue on the Slack channel, so that's great. Um, and we'll see everybody back, um, but via Google Meet um, and a little over a half an hour. Take care, everybody. All right, thank you, Louisa. Thank you, everyone.